So why don't we get started? Bread. I don't really need a big walk-through drill, but just kind of quick and dirty. Um, uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot there. We can do quick and dirty. Please. <laughs> So. so, good morning, committee. For the record, morning. Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, I'll do a quick walkthrough of H237 as it passed the House. <clears throat> so, starting with Section 1, this sets out some legislative intent, which you can read for yourself. It provides that um, it's the intent of the General Assembly to have a sufficient number of drug recognition experts to screen all drivers suspected of driving under the influence. Section two, this is um, the definition section. We're in our um, under the influence chapter in Title 23. Um, so this just adds a definition of preliminary screening. So as you all recall, um, a preliminary screen is the test that's typically taken at roadside when law enforcement has um, reason to believe that a person is driving under the influence. They can offer an, a preliminary screening test. That The results of that test are not admissible. Um, to show evidence of impairment at trial. So this sets out a definition currently, under current law, this um, language about permissive in inference is a little bit buried. Um, so this is intended to draw it up to the front, the definition section, and make it clear that results can't be introduced at trial to show evidence of impairment, and that the, the result of the preliminary screen um, shall not by itself constitute grounds for probable cause for an arrest. So moving on, um, the next section is, uh, this is a DUI statute, prohibits driving under the influence of a drug. Um, so there are only technical changes to this section. Looks like new language, but it's just moved up. What's point one six? What? Pardon me? In the uh, section three, 1201, enhanced penalty for BAC at point zero one, a point of 0.16. In the title. Oh, I see. What is, I've never seen. Is that a mis hmm. Hmm. I wonder if that um, needs to be updated. Let's, let's take a look at that. it comes back from the day when it was 1 point, point I don't even remember one. I remember one, 0 0.15. I'll take a look. Just Good. see where that comes from. So anyway, technical changes only there. We just move up that 0.04 for commercial vehicle. Yep. So I'll move on to section four. This is the implied consent statute. So as you'll recall, currently everyone who operates a motor vehicle in Vermont is deemed to have given their consent to an evidentiary test mm -hmm. um, for the purposes of determining um, a blood alcohol content or presence of another drug in their bloodstream. And the evidentiary test is admissible at court to um, show evidence of impairment and is required when law enforcement has reasonable grounds to believe that a person's operating under the influence. So the changes here add saliva to the implied consent statute. So um, if you look at page four, subsection three, this adds the saliva test um, to the implied consent statute so that if law enforcement has reasonable grounds to believe the person is driving under the influence, then um, he or she is deemed to have given consent to an evidentiary saliva test. So, um, How do we know they wouldn't use it for DNA information? Well, um, there is some language there, some specific language at the end of that new subdivision that um, the saliva test is only to be used for the limited purpose of showing impairment and shall not be used to... I don't to, know they would. You don't, I suppose, except for that they are... They don't destroy the evidence. Hand it back to the individual, whatever. It's true. Can I, can I yeah. go back and ask a question? What, under the definition, um, to detecting the presence of a drug, what drug? I, I mean, is there a definition of what drug is going to be identified by the saliva test, or is it just any drug? Or so, right, it would be any drug, so the, so all, um, if you remember, you're under the influence is defined to mean if your ability to drive is impaired um, to the slightest degree, so it could be any drug that impairs your ability 
So to if drive. I took four ibuprofens, it would show up. That's I'm not sure if ibuprofen shows up, um, and I'm probably not the best person to answer okay. what exactly shows up in the saliva test. But there's no definition the here of what drugs we're talking about. Not legal, in terms of the saliva. Not in terms okay. of the saliva test. Okay. I mean, it, okay. under the definition section does define drugs as any regulated drug under Title 18, um, but because you're because the under the, the driving under the influence statute says that under the influence means that your um, ability to drive is impaired to the slightest degree. It could be any drug that impairs your ability to drive. This, this passed the House this way. Pardon? Yeah. House of Representatives passed this bill. Yes. They did. So, uh, so yes. anyway, if we were to move forward, I would certainly want to be clear on how you would sure that they're not using it for any other purposes. I mean, obviously, DNA is drafted from it wouldn't be admissible in a court, but they might use it to <coughs> solve a crime. I don't know. I'm asking out of ignorance. Is this maybe you're not the person to ask this question? Does this test exclude those drugs that might be present that do not affect impairment? I don't, I don't believe so, no. I think we need to ask someone who actually, you know, there are a number of, as I understand, a number of people who's um, organizations that sell this test. And it, it depends upon what the state buy. If this was allowed, what form of test would the, would the state buy? And that would determine how many drugs it tests for. It doesn't test for every drug. Um, I think they all test for marijuana, probably test for cocaine, heroin, things like that. But I'm not sure it tests for better drugs. Right. So do they does it test for, well, maybe I should ask that. I think I'll, I'll I wait. think one yeah. of the manufacturers okay. or somebody, okay. I thought yeah. somebody yeah. is yeah. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Right here. I'll, right. I'll wait and ask the question. <laughs> Okay. okay, so if we're moving on to page five, if you look at subdivision B there, um, so this yeah. under current law, if you refuse an evidentiary breath test and the officer has reasonable grounds to believe that you're operating under the influence, that can be introduced as evidence. Um, your refusal can be introduced as evidence, so it just adds saliva. So if a person refuses an evidentiary saliva test, that can also be introduced at a criminal proceeding. Moving on to section five. This is the administration of test statute, um, adds saliva throughout, uh, so just provides that a saliva test has to be administered by a person who is certified to do so by the Criminal Justice Training Council, um, provides a saliva test like breath tests don't have to be taken by medical professionals. Um, it adds, makes some cleanup changes throughout to remove um, re references to crimper devices. This was all at the um, request of law enforcement. Um, subdivision. What's a crimper device? That, um, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's something that we don't, okay, so I yes. don't need to know. Yeah, so I think that there, there was some old technology. Okay. That <clears throat> All right, thanks. Um, if you look at page. Is the proper term saliva or oral fluid? Um, I think they refer to the same thing. You could, you could use either one. Okay. Was there any discussion in the house about terms? I don't believe so, no. So F on page 8, subdivision <coughs> F, this is the preliminary screen portion of the statute. <clears throat> Just make some changes there to allow saliva testing as a preliminary screen, mirroring that language in the definition section. Um, if you turn to page 9, subdivision I, this directs the Commissioner of Public Safety to adopt rules um, regarding the use of these preliminary saliva screen devices. Um, directs them to consider standards of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in adopting their rules. Can, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, back on page 8, there, uh, it's about four lines down. Failure of a person to provide an adequate breath or saliva sample constitutes a refusal. What's an adequate saliva test? So, what does that mean? I, I'm not refusing, but I don't have enough spit. I mean, what, yeah. what does that mean? Right. So if you um, so under current law, if you have failure, if you don't provide enough breath to um, conduct an accurate sample, that constitutes a refusal. So it would be the same for saliva. You have to provide enough saliva to actually um, successfully complete the test. Okay. 
Better get my spit. Hopefully, I'm not going to get checked. <laughs> Um, if you so the remainder of that subdivision on page 10 provides that any saliva testing device that's used by law enforcement has to be determined by at least two peer-reviewed studies to be a reliably accurate method of detecting the presence of a drug metabolite in the body. All, all they tell you is that there, there's a presence or not a presence. That's right. It does not. They don't tell you anything else. Correct. That's right. It does not tell you anything about impairments. <clears throat> So, what are metabolites? So that's the um, active ingredient that shows up in your bloodstream, or active component of the drug. It's meant to refer to the psychoactive component of the drug that shows up in your in your system. Peer review, that peer review being two other peers. So when a scientific study is published, it has to go through a peer review process before it can be published. Um, a, a group of your Scientific peers, other oh. scientists have to review. Not, not you. Not <laughs> Alice and Joe. Not unless you're. <laughs> we might be good. <laughs> not unless well, you. I don't think we're good, <laughs> They're my peers. Have an advanced so degree. If yeah. the two peers yeah. reviewed it, <clears throat> clear that what that means? Mm -hmm. That is a, a, I believe that's yeah. a term of art that's used in um, the okay. scientific community. And you're comfortable with it. That, that is what it means. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mean else. No. So now. So section six. This is the. This is just a portion of the independent chemical analysis statute. This is the statute that provides that a person has to arrange their own independent test, and it just adds saliva to that statute. And then finally, Section 7 is the permissive inference statute. So this is the statute that provides that if the state proves that the defendant's alcohol concentration at the time of operation met a certain threshold, then the jury may draw an inference that he or she was under the influence at that time. And as at the request of law enforcement, we added some language in subdivision B that refers to the combined influence of alcohol and another drug. Um, and 1201A3 is the is the provision in the DUI statute that it's um, impermissible to drive under the influence of alcohol and another drug. So the intent here was just to um, refer to the statutes that were already encompassed in the statute. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Yeah. Under the combination, combined influence of alcohol and another drug, I understand the, influ the limit of alcohol, so if you had alcohol in your system and any other presence of any other drug? Is that what this means? Because no. Because there's no per se limit to, for drugs. Right. So what the statute currently says, and this is just existing law, it just says that when you're under the influence of any other drug or under the combined influence of alcohol and another drug, any other drug besides alcohol. Right. But so you still have that modifier of under the influence still has to but be But the under the influence is the .08. Is under, that what it means? No, under what the influence it? means um, that your ability to drive safely is impaired to the slightest degree. So the so no, law enforcement still has to prove so, that. No, no, you don't have to. But so if you had You're taking a thyroid drug, yeah, or right. any other drug, if you have any other drug in your system that, besides yeah. alcohol, well, that they can detect. Well, even if they can detect it, does it, does it make it wrong? Well, but there's no so there's no per se limit. So right. that's just one of the ways that law enforcement can can um, charge you under the in DUI statute. Oh, okay. The okay. drug test is meaningless. Correct. There has to be some other That's right, yes. Thing that <coughs> just because you tested positive for the drugs might get you in trouble with the NFL, but wouldn't be anything <laughs> that you did necessarily um, Right, law, law enforcement has to prove right. that you were under the influence. Under the influence yes. in order to so it's, uh, it, it, sometimes we get hung up. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I just reread section one. I, uh, I don't know what the hell that has to do with this, but. It, I don't um, understand either. So I'm concerned that we've forgotten about a ride program that did all that work uh, a few years ago um, regarding the a ride program. I didn't even mention it. it says sufficient number of drug recognition experts. What does that mean? You know, what is sufficient? I suppose mm -hmm. that's up to the, to the, but 
It's usually, you know, I don't know why the House insists on putting stuff like this in, which suggests that the only thing is, that, is that, you know, I don't think anybody disagrees with that decision on the record. I thought that we had, we were there, um, and I thought that we, we can ask the commissioner, but I don't know why that's in there. But doesn't the intent usually relate back to the, the body well, of the bill? The and this so doesn't relate to the body of the bill at all in, in the bill. bill. It doesn't relate. To the <coughs> okay. That's, I was confused by the. But I, I think we've studied this yeah. several times. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we may have even put the term geographic. Right. Mm -hmm. We did. There. Right. <coughs> right. And we have Senator money for it, too. I'm reading this for the first time, so I'm again asking you ignorance. But in a DUI situation, if an officer suspects alcohol consumption, preliminary breath test is given. The preliminary breath test gives the officer the ability to go the next step further and ask for a data master. This statute is saying, or this bill is saying, that the saliva test can't be used as grounds for probable cause for an arrest. Oh, by itself. By itself. So, <clears throat> I'm struggling because in the preliminary breath test situation, you have a data master test at the other end of that conversation. Here, there's no other test after this preliminary device is used. What am I missing? Um, my understanding of the intent of the House in adding this language is that because of the concern that the a preliminary saliva um, test may not disclose information about the person's ability to drive, um, didn't show it may not show evidence of impairment. For example, because uh, if the saliva test showed marijuana, that may not indicate that the person was actually high. Um, that. The idea was that there had to be some other evidence of impairment um, in addition to a positive saliva screen before they could the, listen yeah. to the testimony, but I think yeah. that's an excellent question, Joe. Hopefully the Commissioner of Public Safety or somebody that just wanted to make sure I'm not missing some can help you to answer that question. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank, thank, thank you very much. Then. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Anderson, and, and please feel free to bring up as many or as few of your witnesses. We told you you had an hour to convince us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it won't take that long. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you. Tom Anderson, Commissioner. Hopefully John Campbell doesn't need to. Uh, Tom Anderson, Commissioner of Public Safety. I want to uh, thank, thank the committee for allowing us to uh, speak today. Also with me is Dr. Conti, who is the head of the forensic lab and can answer any questions you've got with respect to the testing, the reliability of the testing, um, how the, this, the DNA issue is a red herring, frankly, um, and why that we would not be collecting this for DNA purposes and, and how, why the lab would not be doing that. Uh, so I think that she can provide uh, any assurances to the committee that they need with respect to the DNA um, issue. So why are oral fluid, why is oral fluid testing, why is it needed? Uh, first of all, um, we're on the cusp of legalizing marijuana. July 1st, marijuana will be legalized in the state of Vermont. And it seems like the opportune time to make sure that we have, we have collectively taken steps to improve and enhance our roadway safety. Um, Vermonters have the right to drive their highways without unnecessarily being endangered by impaired drivers. I think we all can agree on that. Uh, I think they rightfully expect that as part of this marijuana legalization that the state is going to do all it can to stop and arrest people impaired by marijuana and other drugs. I think that's a, that's a fair thing for Vermonters to expect. Uh, Governor Scott has made clear that addressing roadway safety is a precondition to any further consideration of marijuana legalization, and this is a step toward that. Um, oral fluid testing for drugs is simple, it's non-intrusive, uh, it tests for the presence of drugs that impair drivers, such as marijuana, opioids, and other drugs that are impairing. Uh, both the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council and the Marijuana Advisory Board have both uh, recommended that the legislature take steps to approve 
to, to approve oral fluid testing. Uh, that was done after careful study by both of those committees, and it was also part of the Vermont Highway Safety Strategic, <coughs> excuse me, strategic Plan that oral fluid testing be implemented in Vermont. Um, the Vermont House of Representatives have now recognized that oral fluid testing is an important component of marijuana legalization. So again, why is it important? I think uh, for me, and I think the evidence is fairly compelling, that once you legalize marijuana, uh, it's likely to re result in an increased number of deaths on, on your highways. I think the evidence, for me anyway, is fairly compelling in that regard. If you look at Colorado statistics, um, they legalized marijuana in 2012. And for their, their fatality data from 2013 to 2016 shows that there was a 40% increase in the number of all drivers involved in fatal crashes in Colorado. It went from 627 to 880. Uh, Colorado data shows that marijuana-related traffic deaths when a driver tested positive for marijuana more than doubled from 47 deaths in 2013 to 115 deaths in 2016. Marijuana, in Colorado, marijuana-related traffic deaths increased 58% in the four-year average, that is 2013 to 2016, uh, since the legalization of Colorado, recreational, uh, legalization of rec recreational marijuana in Colorado, compared to the four-year average, that being 2009 to 2012, uh, prior to legalization. That was a 58% increase. In 2009, Colorado marijuana-related traffic deaths involved, involving drivers testing positive for marijuana represented 10% of all traffic deaths. By 2016, that number had doubled to 20%. In 2013, in Colorado, drivers tested positive for marijuana in about 10% of all fatal crashes. By 2016, it had doubled to 20%. Uh, the Washington State is the other uh, state that has uh, legalized marijuana. I've been have, that's sort of the track record we've been looking at. Uh, the numbers there are equally grim. Fatal crashes involving drivers who recently used marijuana uh, nearly doubled from 66 to 116 to, in the two years after Washington legalized marijuana. Uh, of the 462 Washington fatalities in 2014, 21% had marijuana impairment as a factor. In 2014, fatalities involving a driver testing positive for THC alone or in combination with alcohol or other drugs increased 108% over the previous four-year average, went from 36 to 75. I think also another good comparison is to look at Vermont. Uh, we decriminalized marijuana in 2013, I believe. And if you look at the pre and post decriminalization of marijuana in Vermont, um, where at least one driver tested positive for marijuana, uh, the results are this. For the three year period pre decriminalization, that being January 1st, 2010 to uh, June 30th, 2013, there were 71 crashes. Uh, for the three-year period post-decriminalization, that being July 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2016, there were 91 crashes. That was a 28% increase in crashes, again, where at least one of the drivers in the crash tested positive for uh, marijuana. I picked out the data from 2013 and 2017 because we had roughly the, the equivalent number of fatalities in 2013 and uh, 2017. So in 2017, we had 63 fatalities uh, in Vermont. It was, a high, it, was a, it was a high number of fatalities. Uh, 29 of those, of, of, in, of those fatalities, um, 29 were under the influence of drugs or drugs and alcohol in those fatalities. 18 tested positive for Delta 9 THC, 11 suspected of driving under the influence of drugs and or alcohol, so a combination of, of drugs and alcohol. In 2013, we had similar uh, highway fatalities. We had 64 highway fatalities in 2013. Uh, in that year, 18 were under the influence of, of drugs or, or drugs and alcohol compared to the 29 in 2017. 11 tested positive for Delta 9 THC. <coughs> and nine were suspected of driving under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So again, we saw increases in the uh, uh, pre and post decriminalization in that area. So I know there's some confusion, and we've already had questions this morning about how, how this oral saliva testing, and I think those terms are used interchangeably, oral fluid testing, saliva testing, I think they're used uh, interchangeably. I think oral fluid testing is probably the more correct way to refer to it, but I don't think there's a meaningful distinction between the two. So how does this work? Um, so there is a preliminary screening. It's similar to a screening done in DUI cases. 
Uh, this is the equipment that the opponents of oral fluid testing claim is unreliable. It's the preliminary roadside testing. That, that is the equipment that they claim is not reliable. Um, the, the House Transportation took testimony from two renowned scientists on this issue of reliability, um, and both said they are reliable. They have a reliability rate of 94 to 98 percent reliable. The state police uh, piloted one of these a couple of years ago. We had similar uh, reliability, reliability results. Uh, 14 states have approved some form of oral fluid testing, as have Australia and several countries in, in Europe. So it's not, a new, it's not a new concept. So that's the preliminary, that's the preliminary screening. Then, then there's a, an evidentiary sample collected. Um, and the collection of an evidentiary sample at roadside goes through a full laboratory analysis at the, at the forensic lab in Vermont. Uh, right now, we test for blood. That's how, that's how we do this right now, we test for blood. Um, so I just want, want to clear this, the preliminary test, which, which has the roadside equipment, which is non-evidentiary, it's similar to a, a preliminary breath test used for alcohol. Um, if that test's positive, then an evidentiary sample is collected, and that is sent to the lab, where you then have the full analysis where it tells you, here's the drugs, here's the quantity, uh, here's the amount of drugs, in the, in the types of drugs, and the, the amount of drugs that are in that person's um, system. Um, and the other thing I, I want to make clear, that, that that testing of this oral fluid, it's, it's been an accepted and reliable testing method for over 25 years. So the evidentiary sample that's going to the lab, uh, the reliability of that testing has been, uh, has been at least deemed reliable for the past 25 years. So I just want to make sure there's no confusion about what we're talking here. We've got a, we have a preliminary roadside test, which I think is where the, where the opponents to this uh, look. And then once you have an evidentiary sample, that is really, that is a reliable test that has been done at the lab. We do it with blood now um, all the time. So I also think it's important to, to look at the steps to implementation of this. You know, legislative approval of oral fluid collection um, is simply the first step. I mean, that is the enabling legislation that lets us, to, allows, uh, gives us a legal framework to go about collecting <laughs> oral fluid testing in connection with uh, roadway safety. You already have, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You already have the ability to test blood tests. We have the ability now and to you test. Can say that this person had X amount of whatever in their blood. Correct. We can. We, we have blood tests is available for now. Is but that used, used against you know as an evidentiary thing to prove um, impairment, or <coughs> is it still? You certainly have to have other factors, and I'm not suggesting otherwise with respect to oral fluid. You cannot just have oral fluid and present a prosecution for, for DUI just based on a test, an oral fluid test. And we're not advocating that. I wouldn't, as a prosecutor, it would be a, uh, it wouldn't be a good case to bring. Uh, so I, there's no one advocating that simply because someone tested positive for. Um, an impairing drug as part of an oral fluid testing, that that would be sufficient to uh, bring, a, bring a case to trial, either, either for probable cause purposes or you know, beyond getting it to a jury and convincing a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. And I do talk about that, the difference between the blood and why that is such an ineffective and inefficient way to do this. Um, I'm also concerned about your initial statements regarding the legalization of marijuana and we can't go any further um, without establishing a saliva test. Because I've heard in the House that some people voted for it under the mistaken belief that in order to get the tax and regulate, you had to have a saliva test. I'm, I'm still not familiar with the connection between those two statements. I think Governor Scott has made clear. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to. It's your. It's your no. Okay, go ahead. I, I think Governor Scott has made clear in his statements that, you know, to consider additional marijuana uh, legislation, that addressing roadway safety is critically important and is a precondition to doing that. And that um, the you know, oral fluid testing would be, is an important component in assuring roadway safety so for Vermonters. In order to get the tax and regulate, we have to approve oral fluids. Uh, as that one. I, I guess I'd leave that for your interpretation. Well, I think what the governor's made pretty clear when he, when he signed 511 
was that roadway safety was, an, you know, addressing roadway safety um, and some other things. And I forget exactly what they were, but roadway safety was one of the critical things that needed to be addressed uh, prior to uh, further consideration of marijuana legislation. Well, I, I'm just, um, first of all, I, I think that the statistics that you gave at the beginning are, in my opinion, suspect. Not your statistics, but where they came from. Because one of the things that we heard from Colorado was that one of the reasons it increased so dramatically was because they didn't test before. So of course now if they're testing everybody, it is going to increase because they weren't testing before, but I'm not gonna, my, I guess my question is, in the other countries where they use this, do they have a per se limit on, just like we do for alcohol, do they have a per se limit for other drugs? Um, uh, with respect to what other countries do, I don't have an answer to that. I do know the states, some of the states have uh, presumptive levels. Some states That's don't have presumptive, presumptive levels. Yeah, some, okay. some states have presumptive okay. levels, like I know Colorado does, right. and some states don't. So uh, that's a mixed bag as to whether uh, you have to have a you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.05 nanograms per milliliter. Um, I, I'm not advocating that. I don't think the science is good behind that. Right. And I think there is a fair amount of confusion about, oh, if we don't have a number, you know, how can we possibly pass this if we don't have a number like alcohol? And to me, the, that thinking is, we can't think of this like alcohol. It's not the same. Um, so or, what oral fluid testing does and what the results do is give, it, it simply give you another piece of evidence in the, in the, in the, the, total, the total evidence that will be presented in a case. It's simply another piece of evidence. It's, it's evidence like the, just like the officer's observations that you were driving crooked, talking crooked, walking crooked. <coughs> Um, it is the, it, it, it may confirm the DRE's opinion that um, the person, that in their opinion was under the influence of some impairing drug. And then you would have this additional piece of evidence that, oh, and in there, the, the, the oral fluid testing showed they had marijuana, cocaine, opioids, whatever it happens to be. So I, I, what I'm trying to tell people is don't think of it like alcohol. We get stuck in this rut of thinking you have to have a presumptive level, and you don't. This is just another piece of evidence, and for me, public policy, more evidence is a good thing, not a bad thing from a public policy standpoint. But if it just shows more ev that there's some other drug there, it doesn't necessarily improve, it doesn't necessarily prove that there was more impairment just because there's a evidence of some other drug in the body. It, it, does, it does not standing alone no, 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 prove, but even prove impairment. In terms of more evidence, it doesn't, if you have a, I, I don't know, I'll have to hear what kinds of drugs it, it tests for and everything else, but I don't know that it We're shows. Well, yeah. Okay. So, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. That's right. And just, uh, I, the numbers I gave you are from the, they were reported by the Denver Post relying on the, the, the Colorado Department of Health. Right, so right. So that's where those, that's where that data no, comes the numbers from. No, the numbers are true, the story behind them is different. Okay. Um, so I feel like the steps that would have to, so you know, legislative, and enabling legislation is the first step. Uh, we'd have to then, I would have to go through the, the process of picking the device, um, <coughs> going through rulemaking, purchasing that device, um, and then it would have to be deployed, it would have to be deployed in the field. But even after that, the whole issue of the admissibility in court will come up. Um, so whether, you, whether, utilizing oral, whether utilizing oral fluid um, will be admissible in court, I'm confident will be heavily litigated. Uh, it will be litigated uh, by the defense counsel that it's not reliable under the Daubert test, it's not scientifically reliable and therefore should not be admitted. So that's going to have to be litigated at the district court level, the superior court level. It's also going to have to be litigated at the Supreme Court level. And as I said, I said the same thing before the House, like that, that will be, that will be uh, hotly litigated. And I think the courts are the best place to determine the, the admissibility and reliability of these sorts of, of, these sorts of tests. So it's a, it's a multi-year process, I think, before we've ever, we've come to the determination, yes, it's admissible, no, it's not admissible, um, you know, how we're going to collect it, the, the, the equipment we're going to use to collect it, it's going to take time to work work one of these through through the court. The blood test? 
Uh, I, and I'll look that to someone else here. I'm confident people have, to have, have challenged the blood test. Um, but let me, that's a good segue. Let me tell you why oral fluid testing is better than blood testing, okay? okay? Um, collection of blood from someone is extremely intrusive. You're sticking a needle into someone's arm and pulling blood out of them. Um, it's also an ineffective way to do this. It wastes valuable law enforcement resources. Um, and let me just walk through the steps of collecting blood for you, just so you, know, you can understand how ineffective this is. So first of all, an officer's got to make observations of impairment while someone's driving. Um, they then have to, they pull them over, they talk to the individual, they think there is still, so they're seeing more signs of impairment. They then do field sobriety tests, and we're all familiar with those. They then, let's say the preliminary breath test is negative. Luckily, I'm not all that. Well, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> let's say the preliminary I'm breath test is, 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 is negative for alcohol or shows a very low level of alcohol. Um, they then, but they think the person is impaired, that the impairment they're seeing is not, it really does not correlate with what they're seeing on the preliminary breath test. So they have reason to believe that the person is under the influence of some impairing drug. They then get a DRE in there. That might take a half an hour, an hour to get a DRE there to do, do their thing, uh, reach the conclusion that the person is under the influence of some impairing drug. Uh, then they have to prepare an affidavit uh, to, because they now have to go get a warrant for, for the blood. They then have to find a judge to look at that warrant. Uh, they then have to go get the warrant. Um, and they then have to take the person to the hospital for a blood sample. So as you can see, it's a, it's a, it, it is just inherently a time-consuming process um, that then requires someone to undergo a blood sample withdrawal at a hospital. Um, and it all depends on whether the, you know, the law enforcement can take, has reasonable grounds to believe the person is under the influence of, of drugs. Um, because taking blood is so intrusive, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that a warrant is required for taking of blood uh, because it's significantly more intrusive than taking a breath sample. You don't need a warrant for a breath sample. You need it for a blood sample. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has also held that the collection of DNA sample by a rubbing swab or an oral fluid swab inside a person's cheek is a negligible intrusion for Fourth Amendment purposes. <clears throat> and the Vermont Supreme Court has also held that a, tweaks, a cheek swab for DNA collection in, in connection with post-convictions post is minimally intrusive and does not violate Article 11 of the uh, Vermont Constitution. But, uh, but they also ruled that just based on arrest, it wasn't, am I correct? Correct. So you can't take an oral so fluid swab I, at arrest. That's, that's, you have not been convicted. <clears throat> and um, I very much disagree with the Supreme Court on that. Um, because the record is clear in other states and where you um, exonerate just as many as you convict based upon the DNA evidence. But we passed a bill um, that they ruled unconstitutional on that particular, of the arrest. So, um, but that, that was the, the swap. So uh, what makes us think that this same Supreme Court, well, a little, somewhat different, would make a ruling supporting this particular bill. That it would not, it would, be, it would or would not require a warrant? No, 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 no. They said that you can't even do it if the person has oh. been convicted. I, I, think, I think the analysis. For DNA purposes. Yeah, this is for DNA purposes, which is a very, very different purpose. Well, well why, why wouldn't they rule the same way on this? Well, I, I think, I mean, because I think it's a different standard. I mean, you're going to be looking at the admissibility of this under a Daubert standard. Is it reliable science? Is it reliable of enough for a jury to consider this, uh, to put this in front of a jury for them to consider along with all of the other pieces of evidence you, that they're going to consider? You, you admitted that it would eventually end up with the Vermont Supreme Court. And I'm curious as to why the result would be any different than it was when they said that, that they ruled on the DNA evidence from a cheek squad that it was permissible that the person had been convicted, but not if they hadn't been convicted. I, I, I guess, you know, it's a fool's errand to try to predict what the Supreme Court is going to do, but I, I do think these are very different standards. When you're talking about collecting for DNA purposes, and you're talking about it collecting it and admissibility, yeah, and admissibility for 
uh, uh, DUI purposes. Because remember, you know, DUIs. Are, I mean, driving is a privilege in the state. It's not a right. It's a privilege that the state can put con that the state can put conditions on. So, you know, I, you know, I do think the Supreme Court. You know, I, I, I do think that there is the the whether it's constitutionally permissible to collect a, a sample of someone's uh, breath or blood. That, that, that decision has been, that is constitutional. It's yeah. constitutional that we do it now with blood in this situation. Um, it's constitutional to collect um, oral fluid, as we talked about, saliva for purposes of DNA collection uh, at booking or after conviction in Vermont. Um, the collection of fingerprints is constitutional. The collection of fingernail scrapings is constitutional. The collection of pubic hair is constitutional. The collection of handwriting exemplars is, is constitutional. To me, there's little question that the collection of oral fluid saliva is constitutional. The, the collection of it is constitutional. To me, the issue is whether, the, whether there's going to be the requirement of a warrant. And I think that will be, that is best addressed by the courts. That is, that is what we have the courts for. They determine whether the collection of that sample will require a warrant or will not require a warrant. And, Believe me, there are reasoned arguments that can be made on both sides of that issue. Um, I think I can make persuasive arguments as to why a warrant re is required, and I can make persuasive arguments as to why a warrant is not required. But I think that is what courts are, are uniquely suited to determine, uh, whether, you know, whether for Fourth Amendment and Article 11 purposes, a warrant is, is or not required. And as I said, you know, uh, you know, as, as we've heard here today, you, you know, opponents, uh, opponents of oral fluid will tell you, it tells you nothing about the level of impairment. Uh, that may be very true, and I think the science is still out on, on that. Uh, but that does not mean it's not valuable evidence. It is important evidence. Um, evidence that a person arrested for driving under the influence of drugs, in fact tested positive for marijuana or other drugs, is an important evidence that prosecutors and jurors should be allowed to consider. Uh, it's evidence that tends to corroborate the officer's observations of impairment. It's evidence that tends to corroborate the DRE's opinion. The person was under the influence of drugs. Um, and I guess the question is, why would we not want to collect relevant evidence in drug driving cases? From a public policy standpoint, more evidence is better than less evidence. There's very good defense attorneys, some are at this table, that will, you know, will make great arguments as to why it's not reliable or why it's not, uh, it shouldn't be enough to convict somebody, but it is evidence. Um, the, pro the, the relevancy of it, the probative nature of it is, is why we have courts. So if somebody blows 0 0.02 in a breathalyzer test, why don't we use that? Because we, it's a preliminary, again, we get back, this is a no, preliminary no, testing. No, the question is, there is no proof that what you get from an oral swab is any more evidence other than a truck driver who has a CDL or a kid who's under 21 has a .02. That's, you know, we're not going to, once you blow that .02, what happens, what does that officer do with that individual? It's either they do, they do not believe there's enough evidence to continue the processing but for a DUI. Why would there be enough evidence if somebody just has a trace of marijuana in their, in their, um, uh, in their uh, oral fluid sample? Uh, you would continue on if there was a trace of marijuana, but you wouldn't have this point. Well, no, because the, the, diff the test is what different. The here? test is different. The preliminary test is going to screen for drugs. So, for example, if I do a preliminary oral but, swab. But, but, but Commissioner, you, your, your officer at the scene is going to continue on if the initial test reveals some level of drugs in the system. Am I correct? He's going to continue on with if the preliminary test shows a positive for drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but, I mean, but understand if, that. But if there was no drugs and it was 0 0.02, the stop would be over. Am I correct? It may very well be over at that point. So the so, the. So we haven't proved. That's my problem with this. So I don't know. We, it hasn't. Again, Am if I, we go back, I if we go back. Things? I, I think you're narrowly looking at things. Okay. So I think if you if you look at the way a processing occurs, no. you have you know, and it's all against this backdrop. The police officer has to have reasonable a reasonable uh, basis to believe that the person is 
driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Now, where does that come from? In the normal case, it's going to come from the observations of the officer. They see the person driving, uh, you know, not driving correctly, some indication of impairment in the driving. They stop the vehicle. They then see uh, evidence of impairment in when they're speaking to the individual, some additional in, uh, evidence of, of impairment. They then may have the person do field sobriety tests. Each of these things is a step. And they're, they're, so if they get out and they do the sobriety what, test, the same you, argument could be made. Like they'll, they, they walk straight, they talk, you know, they, yeah. did the, they passed all the sobriety so tests. Last night I had two beers. Drove from the Capitol Plaza to where I'm staying. If they had stopped me, I would have probably been 0 0.02, 0 0.03, right? I, no, I well, my your guess weight, is as good as my mine. Weight, yeah, I, metabolism, all that stuff. It's been too long since I did these cases right. here. But I'm just suggesting Center. that at 0.03 or even 0.02 or, or nothing, the stop is over, is it not? It very well could be, yes. I mean, maybe, you know, the guy I was following down Route 4, you know, down the mountain, you know, he wasn't intoxicated. He was just reaching for his briefcase and then insisted upon opening it. And I could watch him um, as I was driving down, and he was swerving. He wasn't intoxicated. He was just doing something else. He was certainly distracted. But the, the question is, at point oh two or whatever the person was, who's had one or two beers, is that you know that stop would be over? It may or may not be. I mean, let's say so that you, if you do a cotton and swab and you find no evidence of any drugs, it's over. Well, let's say it, it, it very well that, could but, be. But if you find some evidence, and I don't smoke marijuana, so you wouldn't find it, but maybe I was in a, you know, a restaurant where I didn't even realize somebody, you know, I, I don't know how it would ever get in. But, so if they found a little bit of that, I would be continuing on through the process. You could have been hiking on Mount Philo. Mount no, Philo. Right. No, that's a dog. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where, I, and maybe I'm not trying to be argumentative. No, I, I, and I'm not either. I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the idea that you. Ha I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, if unless the test can show some definitive some impairment, impairment, some in definitive yeah. impairment, that it's not worth, exactly. it's not a worthy piece of evidence. Exactly. And that's where we disagree, okay. because to me, in, in the in the mosaic of evidence that is presented in courts all of the time, okay. it would simply be another piece of evidence for jurors and prosecutors to consider. So, for example, let's say we took you took your example where some of those a point oh two, they have really no signs of of impairment other than you know they, they, their driving was funny because they were reaching down to pick up their their briefcase. Right. Now, as a prosecutor, you may look at that and say, well, I have no, nothing on the on the on the on the BAC. I've got nothing on the on the. Uh, I may have maybe I have something on the drug test, but I have nothing. I have no other evidence of impairment. That's not a very good case for a prosecutor. So, but on the other hand, if you have a case where the person is driving, their driving is not correct, their talking is not correct, their field sobriety tests are not correct, the DRE thinks, in their opinion, they're under the influence of an impairing drug. The fact that they then we did a test and well, they did have an impairing drug in them. That is relevant evidence. That is relevant evidence. Um, and you know, arguments can be made by prosecutors as to you know, why it corroborates everything else. And good defense attorneys will tell you exactly your argument. It doesn't tell you anything about impairment. It doesn't, say, it doesn't tell you anything about whether this person was impaired or not. Those are things that courts do all the time, every day, uh, in the state and around the country. So I guess that's, that's where well, we differ on it. I, I didn't mean to. I know you have some more. No, that's all, that's all I've got. So that's uh, you just. You have other people. You know. I have uh, Dr. Conti is here to answer any questions you have on the reliability issues. You know what we do with the test. Uh, you know what's going to happen to these. What? You know what's going to happen to the preliminary. The, the breath. The preliminary breath test really just gets thrown away. That's not retained at all. Why is the? Why is the? <coughs> I shouldn't worry about DNA. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you let Dr. Conti answer that? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner, did you hand in your testimony, or are you going to? Um, I hadn't, and Would I. Would you? I can. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> They're really notes, but. Uh. Good. Uh, good morning. For the record, I'm uh, Trish Conti. I'm director of the Vermont Forensic Laboratory. Um, uh, thank you for nice having me this morning. Back. Yes, it's nice to be back. I think it's my first time this year. Um, so. Basically, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I will first address um, some of the questions that have already come up through uh, testimony this morning. Um, 
So, and I think Fred will back me up when Fred testifies later, but as far as these um, roadside saliva testing uh, devices are concerned, the scope of drugs that they encompass are impairing drugs. They're not going to be your thyroid medications, your birth control medications, over-the-counter medications. It's major categories of the most commonly impairing drugs. So you're talking about cocaine, opiates, um, methadone, um, benzodiazepines. So you're most commonly things that are found in people that are observed to be impaired by driving. Um, so it's not going to be anything under the sun that you could be taking and following prescriptions for. So that's that's a moot point and not a concern as far as these tests are um, concerned. Um, sure. Yeah. They isolate the drug? Uh, what do you mean by isolate? Well, you said that they will detect an impairment drug, but do they isolate which one? So there are qualitative tests. So what you're going to come back with um, is, based on the, the seven categories of drugs, you're going to come back with either a positive or a negative for each category. So it's going to say cocaine, positive or negative. Opiates, positive or negative. Um, cannabis, positive or negative. So that's all you're going to get for the preliminary test. That leads to another question. Would the blood test be discovered that was some level in a fatal accident, mm -hmm. that was some level of marijuana in the blood? Right. That doesn't tell us whether the person was impaired by that marijuana. It only tells us there was some level. Absolutely. And so when we correlate those into a public safety concern, is there some level that one would see that in other states where they've determined that this is probably somebody impaired? So the other or heroin or any other drug. For that sure. So the other. Well, I mean, yep. other states have some level, whether it be per se or what. Right. Um, so other states like Colorado or Washington, who have set limits of like five nanograms for the the delta nine THC, which is the active metabolite of cannabis. Uh, five nanograms. Five nanograms. Is that a lot? Uh, it depends. I mean, for somebody that doesn't smoke, it could be. For somebody that's a habitual smoker, it might not be. Um, the thing with setting per se limits for drugs is those have been administrative uh, decisions, not necessarily based on science, and I think even the policymakers in those states will tell you that. Um, I would be hard pressed to find a um, scientific expert in the field who would say that at a certain limit, 100% of the population is impaired or 100% is not. What about methadone? You mentioned methadone. Yep. I assume Suboxone would be the same. Yep. Uh, and different you drugs, detect, yes. If you detect that, people who are being provided with those drugs by the state of Vermont shouldn't be driving. And again, it's one of these things that um, those drugs uh, no, are also it, abused. It should, should, I mean, they're obviously right. being prescribed that drug by a physician. Should they be driving? And it's no different from somebody that's prescribed a prescription painkiller. Um, because you are given a prescription or maintenance treatment for a, for a mental health disorder does not give you the right to drive impaired. Many of these drugs come with warnings that you shouldn't be operating motor vehicles or heavy equipment while taking them because they have that ability. I had a procedure in the hospital and the doctor said I had it at 8 a.m. The doctor said you're not to drive until after 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that would be the same. Absolutely. Yes, just having a prescription does not give you a right to drive impaired. Just, I um, don't quite understand how we define which drugs are uh, impairing drugs. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a standard somehow? Because I think that, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. There are tons of, um, if you take NyQuil, mm -hmm. it says don't, don't drive. Um, is that an impairing drug? It could be, absolutely. So how do, how do we define these sep the impairing drugs that are going to show up in the test? Is that a question for you or for? It could be for both. OK. Um, so I think, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of the manufacturers, mm -hmm. but I think what they did is they took you know, a caveat of what do people see most predominantly when they look at drug impaired driving? And they included that in their scope, because it's going to cover majority of people who are abusing things that are on the roadways. So the definition kind of comes from the manufacturer of uh, that they they've defined the kind of world of impaired Yeah, so they, they've okay. defined looking okay. at, you know, what goes yeah. on in the roadways, what they're going to put into their okay. test to make it the most marketable and usable for okay. the agencies that are going to use it. Yep. As far as from a um, clinical or a toxicological standpoint, um, impairment for me for a drug is anything that's going to impair my ability 
to operate a motor vehicle. So it's basically going to be anything that will impair my brain or my cognitive functions to such an extent that I don't have the facilities in place to drive straight down the highway and be aware of everything that I need to do Including in order to drive. Including the drops they put in your eyes when you Absolutely. load it for yep. your eye test. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that's a different... By the way, the yep. doctor also said I shouldn't make any decisions for 24 hours. Yes. That was probably wise. Probably was. I noticed you, you a member of the Senate making decisions one day with the same procedure within <laughs> six hours. Yeah, well, well you, were not sure. Sure. You, might have, you might have that. taken his advice in more cases no, than just that No, that person should have taken the doctor. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you wouldn't change right. his plea at the time you were under the influence. <laughs> No, no, no I, was on, I had it done on a Monday, and I brought it back. Uh, eight, I was back here. We can't even count on his testimony to answer the questions because no. he was not reliable was because he was under the influence of whatever the medicine was. So there are times when maybe you should. I'm sorry to say, your seriously. your own observations well, of what you did and didn't yes. do during that period yes. are. Well, I was merely pointing sketchy. out that a member of the Senate made a decision when he shouldn't have been. I Joe, Joe hasn't hired me. Then. Joe hasn't hired me as an assistant yet. Okay. But the first thing we would be doing is saying that you have <laughs> absolutely no ability to say conclusively what you didn't didn't do that day. You might tell it isn't that we're stressful. We're, sorry, we're, we're, we're not. It isn't. <laughs> we're not taking your testimony oh, no, seriously. I actually, you know, yes. I had a, actually went to a uh, forum where the commissioner of public safety that night. But I didn't make any decisions. <laughs> mm. But you handled yourself very well. <laughs> as far as you can tell. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, back to the witness. Are there any sure. other questions for? Well, I think the DNA. Yeah, I, I can speak about the DNA. DNA yeah, um, so there's two components here. Um, so we've talked about the roadside test. Um, so for that, um, I think people are familiar with how PBT works, so there's a breath tube that gets attached to the instrument and um, the person blows into it and that's thrown out afterwards. Similar for the roadside um, preliminary drug screen, so there's something that's going to be placed in the person's mouth and it's going to allow collection of oral fluids or saliva and that get, gets popped into a cartridge and then inserted into the device for testing. And again, that's disposable, so none of that is retained. Um, and as far as the um, evidentiary test, if oral fluid is allowable, um, right now um, the laboratory receives three vials of blood for an evidentiary blood test for drugs um, or for some alcohol cases. For oral fluids, it's going to be similar. Um, if the person is um, given an evidentiary oral fluid test, they will have a device that's placed in their mouth, which is a, essentially a pad which will absorb saliva into it, and then it gets placed into a tube with a liquid buffer to stabilize it, and then that's going to get sent to the forensic laboratory. When we receive it, um, we don't willy-nilly kind of decide what we're going to test for, what we're not going to test for. Um, it's very distinct and discreet as far as um, what the type of evidence is that comes in and how we're going to process it throughout the laboratory. The way we process um, toxicology samples is a completely different wing of, and personnel in the laboratory than the arm of the folks who do DNA analysis. Um, these samples are also going to be, if this goes forward, subject to rules that are set in place um, as um, the commissioner talked about earlier, um, which one of those rules that we have currently for alcohol cases is the security and um, essentially fate of the, the testing um, matrices that come so in. So you wouldn't actually get the device that was used to swab roadside. The roadside. Absolutely not. So that. That's disposable. That the, the officer would have it, or the individual, it could be returned to the individual. I suppose, yeah, if they want it. Yeah, yeah. So, are we anticipating that the evidentiary test will be obtained back to the barracks, or that also on the roadside, or do we know yet? So, that's a um, procedural question, which I think is yet to be determined. I think the thing that makes the most sense at this point um, is to parallel it to the DUI alcohol cases so it would be done at the barracks just because you have to go through the implied consent part of it. So I mean it all could be done roadside, um, which there's no reason why it can't be, um, but that's yet to be determined, but it's got to be that post implied consent. Um, so those samples, um, if we mirror the, what we do for alcohol, um, those samples are eligible for disposal or destruction after a certain number of days. Uh, we give a window to allow 
uh, the opportunity for the operator to come back and say they want independent testing to be done. So we give them a window of, it's 45 days in statute, but we actually hold it for 90 days to allow them um, that opportunity. So I imagine it would be the same for oral fluid testing. So we would keep it for a certain number of days, which are outlined in the rule, and then they're going to be discarded and, and incinerated at that point. So, so is that also the case if there was an accident, or wouldn't you keep it long? So we don't always know the circumstances of the cases that come in. So we don't know if it's a simple um, you know, DUI case or if it was a DUI fatality. <laughs> we don't often know. So we rely on um, communications with either the investigating officer or the state's attorney to say, you know, this is a DUI fatality. Um, can we please hold the sample for extended period of time? And we will make notes of that in our system and hold it for longer. But the actual, the manufacturer of the um, evidentiary collector for the oral fluids, the stability on that, it's only guaranteed for, I think, 30 days. So it's not like these did, things are good forever. Did I hear correctly, the commissioner, and commissioner can correct me, that we had a pilot project on this at some point? Would this device, would that device that use saliva? So back in 2015, uh, the state police did a pilot program looking at two different um, roadside oral fluid devices. Um, we had a, a small cadre of samples just because it was a completely voluntary process. And the operators were asked at the end, the complete end of processing, whether or not they would like to submit a sample. So we only ended up with, I think, less than 10 um, post-arrest samples. So then we, we changed tax and we went to the um, rapid intervention program as part of the Chittenden County um, program. And so those people that were coming in for um, urine collections to see if they were following the program were asked if they also wanted to give an oral fluid sample. So we did it that way. And after our data was collected and um, we sent it to Barry Logan, who is uh, an expert in the field out of NMS laboratories, he compiled all the data because he's also run a number of larger pilot studies throughout the country and looked at our data to see what the um, the results looked like, and they were very positive. They were? Yes. So this would be a way to, to is this cheaper than um, blood, and is it cheaper than um, the urine tests that people do that are in a drug <coughs> treatment program, or, you know, not supposed to use drugs? Right, so the, the cost of the, so you have to look at the cost of the roadside testing, and then there's the cost of the evidentiary testing. So the roadside testing, we don't have a parallel for it right now. Okay. So that's a completely new cost that we would have to um, implement somehow. Um, we believe there are federal monies available to get that program up and started, um, but that's a completely new uh, facet. As far as the evidentiary test goes, it's um, comparable or slightly cheaper than doing the blood draws we do right now. Uh, we would have to pay for the collector devices. But the offset of that is then you don't have hospital fees, because right now we're paying for anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred dollars each time someone goes to the emergency room to have blood drawn. Uh, so that's a, uh, other questions? Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Thank you. Back. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy. Thank you. Um, anybody who's next, Commissioner? No, that's it. That's, that's, I'm done. So that's, uh, that's all for, we have from the Department of Public Safety. We've got a number of troopers here. They, I, I think we've covered, uh, unless you want to hear from them, they can close the intimidation. Pardon me? It's an <laughs> Oh, they're just here to intimidate you, John? <laughs> <laughs> can, can I uh, take one brief luxury since with our previous witness? Yeah, sure. Um, last, one of the last times you were here, we were talking about the backlog of uh, tests. DNA, DNA, DNA tests. Yeah. Any general observation about whether we've made great strides since then? Absolutely. So we did like a hardcore press after we came in here because I kind of left with my tail between my legs. Not because we'd necessarily done anything wrong, but I felt horrible <laughs> coming in here and telling you that we had a backlog of 3,000 samples. Um, so we, over the course of about eight months, we completely eliminated that backlog. Okay. And right now, our backlog is essentially what's come in the previous month. So great. it's negligible. That's wow, good to hear. That's good. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the good news. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, wait a sec. Where's the bad news? <laughs> We're waiting for it. <laughs> thank you. Um, Pepper, your schedule is next. But so we brought in our um, traffic resource safety prosecutor to answer any questions about how this might be used in a prosecution. Okay. Um, <coughs> then after the break, we'll get the friend and Brad Myers and a Whatever else we get to, we don't get to today, we'll get to next week.
Okay. So um, I'm the traffic safety resource prosecutor for the state, right. Heather Brochu. Um, Heather? Heather, yeah. yes. For the record, you need to make statements. Absolutely. Um, so from a standpoint from a prosecutor, I was a prosecutor in um, St. Albans, Franklin County for about uh, nine years prosecuting. Uh, about 90% of my cases were the traffic-related crimes from a DUI one up to the DUI fatalities. Um, and the DUI drug cases obviously fall in there as well. Um, the oral fluid testing, as I see, is another, and it's kind of, I know the commissioner already hit on this, it's another tool in the toolbox to um, investigate these cases. As a prosecutor, I would never uh, file a case with just a, a positive um, test for drugs because I wouldn't ethically be able to file that case, and I wouldn't do that. I would need to have um, some observations of impairment to go along with that. This is sort of confirming um, what the officer um, has seen. Usually there'd be an officer and a drug recognition expert um, or an officer at least has the um, ARI training that can make these observations wherein it stops. It can start has um, a stop for something that is failure to have a turn signal. And in talking to the operator, they see um, indicia of impairment, um, ask them to exit the vehicle, do the field sobriety, see additional indicia of impairment. Right now, how it stands, um, they would ask for the preliminary breath test. Here with the oral fluid, they could ask for an oral fluid test, um, which would show presumptive positive at that stage four, could show presumptive positive at that stage four um, drugs in the system. And then they could proceed from there to have a DRE and take it further. And after having a DRE evaluation, can ask for the evidentiary test, which by its name um, suggests what it is. Complete sure. Um, and I completely because I've seen video cam, you know, whatever you call it, from the officer's uh, either body camera or the officer's um, car camera. It seems to me to be the most effective tool in determining whether somebody, I, you know, watching Tiger Woods, for example, on the video, um, or watching a former state official go through the sobriety test. You know, I don't know how anybody could say, well, no, I wasn't impaired. And, and so it would seem like as a prosecutor, that might be the most important tool. And I'm not sure what, maybe you could I, I would help me understand sure. why you need this additional tool that doesn't tell me whether the person's impaired or not. So um, I do believe. I mean, isn't that kind of inflammatory while there was marijuana in the system? Therefore. No, I, I, don't, I, I disagree. I. I I will agree with yes that seeing the um, physical signs of impairment, yeah. um, if we do have the cruiser cam body cams, it's most well, times we do now. Um, the only, th yes, I do think that's a big piece of evidence, and that's why I said with the test alone, I would never go even file it. However, I will tell you that in prosecuting cases where I have no test and I also have no refusal for various reasons and gone to a jury because I do have these signs of impairment, I have had jurors call me and say they want that number. They want something to confirm something was in their system. So that's where it puts it all together. But, but it doesn't tell me that the, the problem is if somebody is at, let's say, 1.6, which is the number that they had in the heading of the property. Somebody's at that, mm -hmm. you know. You know they're 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 gone, right? I mean, they're gone they're mean, definitely gone. Me here. They're definitely sure. impaired. Right? But if somebody is at point whatever sure. in marijuana, there's no evidence that that's an impaired level. That's what I. That's where I'm struggling to understand why we would want this there's information. Why you as a prosecutor, mm -hmm. other than inflaming a jury? No. Um, and I would never want to inflame a jury, but it would show it's an impairing substance, and then I, I put it all together like I do any case, the puzzle, I have the DRE say, I see impairment, here's what I'm seeing, and oh, by the way, we've confirmed that that substance is in their system. We don't have a per se level like Dr. Conti spoke to. Right. I also, just going off tangent a little bit, you asked about the O2, if someone was yeah. O2. Um, there are cases where if someone's O2 and I have signs of impairment, yes, then that's a case you can file. Everyone is going to be different. I mean, I've had cases, the lowest I've had is an 04, but we had signs of impairment and have gotten a conviction at an 04 for under the influence, because they were under the influence, and for everyone, it's different. I can tell you for myself, I'm going to be under 08 before I'm impaired. 
everyone has different. So same with um, marijuana or heroin or different drugs. It's going to affect people differently, right. and that's why we have the signs, and then we're putting it all together. We're giving them the full picture. I understand that, but you're before a jury. Yes. And you're allowed to say that this person tested on one of these oral fluid tests at some level of marijuana in their system, forgetting heroin and other everything sure. else. Isn't that something that you're using against that person? Yes. Without a basis to know if that contributed to the impairment? Not. We'd have the basis because we'd have the observations. You don't know that, that the cause of their impairment was the marijuana in their blood. No, and that's. You know that, the, that they were sure. impaired. And that would be for the jury to come back, because what we have to show is, that, show is that they're impaired by a drug. The DRE will call a class of drugs. And we will give them that evidence to say, here is the evidence we have to show they're impaired by this drug. The jury can come back and certainly say okay. no. Also, for an under the influence case, if I have a test, if I take it to the jury solely as an under the influence, not above 0.08, and they have a 1.6 in their system, or they have, or my test shows X, that piece of evidence alone, the jury instructions will say is not enough to convict, that I have to have more than that test, which is what would be here. There'd be an instruction saying the test alone is not enough to convict, would be my understanding. Well, I'm just curious. So what we're doing is providing them the full picture, similar to if they had nothing in their system. Seems way, yeah. Well, Maybe I'm asking a question in a, in artfully. I, I, I I'm concerned that if that it is used as additional evidence, because the mere fact that it's there mm -hmm. does not necessarily contribute to the to the impairment. So how can it be used as additional evidence of impairment if we have no understanding of how that contributed to the impairment? I mean, if, for, I, I don't know about heroin or cocaine or anything about how it stays in the system. I do know that marijuana stays in the system for 30 days. So if on day 28 it shows that there was marijuana in the system and you use that as evidence, it, it has nothing to do with impairment. But it show, it, so but it's being used as additional evidence of impairment under that drug. So I, I don't get the connection here of, of mm -hmm. wh how, how it's used as additional evidence if it doesn't, if there's no evidence to show that it was contributed to the impairment. That's my. So uh, for one, there's a difference. What I think you're talking about for the 30 days would be an inactive metabolite and not an active metabolite, meaning that there's no psychoactive. And, and the lab test shows that it breaks it down. Mm -hmm. and says it's inactive. So at that stage, it would not be an active metabolite, and that's not something that would But it shows up in the, blood, in the saliva test. It anyway. shows up as inactive. Right. So but it shows up as deep. It shows, it, it does, but that's not something that a case would be filed on. If it's inactive, it wouldn't go to a jury because it's not causing impairment. It's, it's an inactive. It's not, doesn't have the okay. impairing abilities. It's a breakdown, and it shows, um, Every drug has that breakdown of metabolites, the active and inactive. But a, but a prosecutor could still bring that evidence in and show that it was there. The inactive? And, yeah. Um, no? I, I don't see where that would ever happen because <laughs> the point is, is that it's inactive and it says right on it and it explains it's inactive. So I don't see how that's beneficial to a prosecutor to bring that in. I don't see how a prosecutor would bring that if they understood, which the ones who are prosecuting these cases understand. Plus, we also talk to the experts, the doctor Senator committees. Senator Nicola okay. has a, sure. a good question. Yeah, right. Sure. Sure. As opposed to mine. Senator White and Senator So I'm just wondering <laughs> about what, what do you envision as the, the, the suspect going through the DRE as well as the saliva evidentiary test, the second one that happens? Do you see that? Do you think most people will now be going through all of that, both, both methods? Calling in the DRE as well as doing the selection. I think the DRE is, is uh, critical. You have to have. So I think that's going to be. Yeah, it's not just having. It's not saying that you get, that we have this oral fluid testing and we uh, jettison so we're everything else. The DREs anyway. Yes, and I think they're a critical part to um, putting the full picture together. I mean, that is from the state's point of view. You know, uh, putting on 
all the evidence, um, having all the evidence, we always just have to disclose everything. Um, but as far as putting it to the jury, it's the full picture, and the DRE gives us that link between just, hey, here's um, the fact that we found drugs in the system, and even active drugs, but we need something to link that and to give the full picture, and that would be the DRE or um, another expert that can say, here's what we saw, this is impairment, these drugs cause, you know, yeah. what we're seeing, the poor coordination, the... Can I just one other thing? So with regard to if they decide to do the second evidentiary test at the, at the scene on the road, um, why wouldn't they just move to that one anyway? In other words, you get some test on the first one and you say, oh, well, there's probably something else here. I'll move to the second one. Is the second one actually a better test or is it just that that will be a, I mean, you, you describe two different tests, one with like a, a flat cotton versus the other one. I don't know what the other one has. But. So um, roadside, that would be okay. the preliminary similar to like the preliminary breath test and then the evidentiary. Right. So my understanding the evidentiary is, is and I, is it's test? more of Dr. Conti's wheelhouse, but more, it is more sophisticated would be my understanding. I think it, um, there might, so I'll leave it at that. That's, but. Okay. So um, they would be able to call a lawyer before that test. Um, it, uh, Right now, our statute is such that before you, um, so it's a statutory right, not a constitutional right, but that's statutory, so not every state has that. Our state has that by statute that when, before you uh, make a decision about an evidentiary test that you are provided that right to counsel. I want to make sure that we get after the break to the Newport Chief of Police, yeah. I want to make sure we hear from Fred, yeah. the North of the Marriage and Products Manager, and I want to make sure we hear from Brad Myers. Anybody else I've missed who hopefully can be with us next week when we take it up again. So I, I want to make sure we can get either any other questions. Heather, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Um, why don't we take a 20 minute break and we'll be back here at 10 30. Bradley Larson. Brad, it's uh, Dick Sears. Good morning, Dick. Good morning, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee and a number of other witnesses and interested folks in the, in the room, um, as well as uh, it's actually being filmed on uh, Orca Media, and uh, that's a local TV, uh, cable TV uh, group. So uh, while you're not being filmed, you're, the phone is. <laughs> so just so you're aware of that. We do have a copy of your testimony. Um, and I know that you were uh, a member of a uh, DUI drug offense enforcement challenges um, report of Act 158 of 2016. So uh, you're very familiar with the proposal uh, to do saliva testing um, that passed the House of Representatives and would love to hear your comments on why it's a good idea, or bad idea, or whatever else. Thank you. Uh, first of all, how much time do I allot it? Because I want to uh, make sure that I don't run over. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure you won't, but hopefully 20 minutes, 25. Okay. Um, Is that enough? That, that's fine. Thank you. I, I, first, uh, to reintroduce myself to members of the committee, uh, I have been practicing uh, in the area of DUI defense and DUI drug defense for 35 years. Uh, the part of my practice, I've also been to a number of trainings, uh, in fact, most recently in January, for DUI drug defense. And uh, I, I, I first want to talk about the, uh, actually the, the preamble, section one, uh, the legislative intent drug recognition experts. I can tell you that while the, uh, the DRE, and it's not drug recognition experts, it's drug recognition evaluation, while it's been deemed uh, admissible under the Vermont Rules of Evidence, my experience has been uh, in virtually all the cases I've defended that even though experienced drug recognition evaluators perform the 11-step uh, the evaluation protocol, with the 12th step being the request for the evidentiary test. Uh, I find that uh, it's basically confirmation bias. An expert under the law is somebody who, by training and experience, 
uh, is qualified to render an opinion in a particular matter, taking into account the facts at hand, uh, commonly accepted methodologies and protocols for arriving at a particular opinion, and uh, setting aside any, any personal bias or favoritism in order to render uh, an impartial opinion. And I will make no apologies by telling the committee that that is simply not the case in the DRA cases I have defended. Uh, what happens is there is an automatic presumption starting from the initial contact between uh, the road officer and the person who is stopped. If they smell marijuana, then there is a presumption that the person is under the influence. And any, uh, any uh, factors such as the person having a cold, which explains, you know, bloodshot or watery eyes or runny nose, or that they might be nervous, which would explain dry mouth, uh, both starting from the roadside, the roadside processing up through when the person unfortunately is taken to the station and they have to go through the DRE protocol, any, uh, any facts that do not support an opinion of impairment are essentially uh, ignored or minimized during the course of the evaluation. And I see this time and time again in comparing the DRE reports, written reports provided by the officer, uh, in comparing those with what I see on the video. And I, I just think that there is a built-in uh, built presumption of authority that legislators give the DRE program and officers who administer it. And setting aside the good intentions of the officers who administer the program, I think that that, that presumption of reliability or validity is simply not warranted. Having said that, I, and I, the, the chairman has heard me say this before in regard to uh, driving under the influence of alcohol legislation, I think that the Section 1 legislative intent portion is just I, I don't think it needs to be embodied in the law. It could be used as a statement of public policy, but that is it. Now, turning to the proposed amendments to the statute, uh, I will say as a general proposition, as a lawyer and as a citizen concerned with privacy and civil liberties, I, I am very, very worried about the push to legitimize saliva testing. Uh, I just, I can't emphasize enough, there is a huge difference between the, uh, the breath and blood alcohol testing program and the drug testing program as it relates to saliva. Saliva is closer, I believe, on a constitutional and an evidentiary basis than breath. And my concerns start with uh, the proposed amendment section 11 the preliminary screening portion. Uh, in many <coughs> DUI cases, I find that it, off, it is often the case that the officer simply at the end, whether it's at the end of the roadside testing or at the very beginning, that perhaps Senator Benning uh, could confirm this, that the officer simply sticks the preliminary breath testing device up to the person and says, blow. Not telling the person they don't have to do it, some officers do, uh, if the person has the courage enough to say, I don't, you know, do I have to do this, which a lot of folks don't, uh, officers will say, no, you don't have to. But oftentimes people simply assume, because the officer is asking them to do it, that they have to do it. They don't know that they have the right to refuse. Now, in a driving under the influence of alcohol case, the refusal to provide a preliminary breath test can be admitted into evidence, although, of course, under Section 1203 sub F of Title 23, the preliminary breath test result itself should not be admitted into evidence. Yet, I see in, and particularly in civil suspension <coughs> cases brought under Section 1205 of Title 23, that the preliminary breath test results are routinely admitted into evidence unless there is a, a good objection by the defense lawyer. And I think that the preliminary breath test, the use of preliminary breath tests, has been expanded far beyond what the legislature wanted 
in uh, placing those limitations in section 1203 sub f. And I say this because I am very concerned that the way section 11, the proposed amendment section 11, uh, sub section 11 of uh, section 12,000, it, it, it's pretty similar to what, uh, what the legislature has uh, said concerning the use of roadside blood test results. Yet, even though, this, even though section 11 says the results of a preliminary screening shall not be introduced as evidence of impairment in any court proceeding, uh, it, it's, it's going to come in. Prosecutors, in my experience, unfortunately, will try to get in the results of the preliminary breath test, uh, even at trial, so that we have to file motions in limine in order to keep them out. And I, I just, it, <clears throat> further in the statute, it, it talks about, uh, I believe, that a failure to provide a preliminary breath test, uh, preliminary saliva test, would be deemed a refusal. And as I'm sure you've heard from other opponents to the statute, uh, a, a person for which, may, many reasons will not or may not be able to provide a preliminary sample of breath, excuse me, of, uh, of saliva. You're going to deem that a refusal. People are nervous around police, and when they're nervous, they, uh, their mouths dry up. It's just a common physiologic response. Is that, is that involuntary action of the body going to be deemed a refusal? Again, it, 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 it emphasizes the difference between saliva and breath. Saliva is much closer to blood, I think, from a privacy and an evidentiary standpoint, and it should be treated as such. Um, looking, uh, looking at the news here. You may want to, um, what, what I think you were just referring to is on page four, uh, three, saliva test. If the law enforcement officer has reasonable grounds to believe that the person is under the influence of a drug other than alcohol or under right. combined influence, the person is deemed to have given consent to take the evidentiary sample as well. Right. I, well, I, I can talk now about, uh, I think, constitutional concerns about okay. saliva testing, which uh, Senator, Senator Nick has a question. Just perhaps. to go back to the um, the fact that someone might not have enough saliva. So at the top of page eight, the failure of a person to provide an adequate breath or saliva sample constitutes a refusal. Right. Are you able to successfully argue that that someone didn't have enough breath? I can think of somebody that has COPD and can't blow enough. Have you had any of those cases where yes. you successfully yes, argued yes, that? Um, uh, you know, persons, persons may not be able to give, uh, someone may not be able to give an adequate breath sample right. for a number of reasons. They might have a mouth injury and they can't, uh, they, they can't provide an adequate, uh, you know, they can't uh, fasten their lips to the, uh, to the breathing tube. Uh, they, may, they may have emphysema or, uh, or other problems. So have you had any success, are you, have you had any success arguing yes. that? Yes, I have. Okay. okay. I have, but again, it's on a judge by judge basis. Some judges, uh, uh, look at these issues differently than others. But I, I think that with saliva, again, being so different from breath, mm -hmm. uh, most folks, even the people who've done nothing other than wrong, other than have a license plate out, they can stop by a police officer. They see the blue lights, they're going to get nervous. And when people are nervous, they cannot provide an addict. You know, their mouths dry up. Is that going to be deemed a refusal? Uh, the law of refusal, as Senator Benning knows, is that um, there has to be some kind of voluntary action. Uh, you know, uh, the person, it, it's not enough for the person to say, I'll provide a breath sample, and then um, they'll burp or take some kind of action that's inconsistent with that intent. Saliva, the body's production of saliva is an involuntary response. And my fear is that we're going to see a lot of refusals being litigated simply because the person may simply be unable to provide 
an adequate sample of saliva. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, looking, I, I will save my remarks regarding the constitutionality uh, for the end. I'm very troubled that section 1202 sub 3. Uh, let me go to that here. It's on page four. Okay. Uh, section 12 of the page is all next to It's on page four of our bill. Okay, yeah, because I, I uh, printed the statute here. Yep. <sighs> so why the test? Yeah, uh, I apologize. I just I got my pages no, all mixed up there. Well, we'll oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, yeah. Um, section 1203, uh, sub 3. Yeah. Implied consent for an evidentiary test, uh, give implied consent to an evidentiary sample of saliva. Um, I, the uh, United States Supreme Court in Birchville versus North Dakota, yeah, which has been applied in Vermont through the Vermont trial courts. Uh, my understanding is there is a decision pending before, the, a case pending before the Vermont Supreme Court on this issue, has said that at least with regard to blood, when you have an invasion of the human body, uh, using blood in a driving under the influence case, and the court didn't distinguish between driving under the influence of drugs or driving under the influence of alcohol, although the Birchfield case dealt with driving under the influence of alcohol. Um, there are constitutional protections that must be followed because there is an invasion of the, an invasion of the, private, of the body. Therefore, a warrant must be obtained, according to the Birchfield case, before a blood sample can be extracted for evidentiary use in the driving under the influence of alcohol case. My concern, unless I'm misreading uh, at page four, section three, that the insertion of this section is an end run around the constitutional protections of a warrant that the Bridgeville opinion and various trial courts in Vermont require before you can use a blood test in a uh, driving under the influence case. And I, I just, I, I, just, I find it very, very frustrating with all due respect to the committee that we, sit, that we continue to erode the, the constitutional protections, limited as they are, for persons accused of driving under the influence. Just to and, be clear, that the House of Representatives passed this. The Senate, right. and, the Senate and, is considering it, but hasn't voted. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I, so I, I would say the for your, your representatives. I believe they both right. voted for it. Uh, and yet, yes, unfortunately, and I've, I've tried to lobby them otherwise. And, and uh, senators, uh, the fact that the House passed this bill should not in any way govern your consideration of it with regard to the protections afforded to persons who are charged with driving under the influence of marijuana or other drugs in Vermont. I, we, we will challenge the content if this bill passes. Uh, I know that Defender General and the uh, Vermont Civil Liberties Union has said that, um, that they will challenge the constitutionality of the bill. And I, I would like to join in that effort. I just think, uh, I, I just think it's an end run uh, in various ways around the Vermont Constitution. I, in, in my remarks, I talked, I spent some time talking about state versus Therian, um, excuse me, state versus Medina, where the Vermont Supreme Court considered whether a warrantless, suspicionless DNA collection uh, by buccal swatting from the lining of the mouth, a person's array for felony after determination of probable cause, was an unconstitutional search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment, Chapter 1, Article 11. In, in the case of a person who has been suspected 
uh, driving under the influence of uh, marijuana or some other substance. First, the request for a saliva sample or it is a seizure under the law. A request to provide a preliminary blood test has also been deemed a search. And the, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court has said that a blood test, again highlighting the difference for my purposes here between breath and saliva, a, uh, a roadside blood test is a minimal intrusion uh, so long as a person, the officer can point to specific articulable facts indicating that the person has been driving under the influence of alcohol. It ain't that easy when we're talking about driving under the influence of marijuana or some other drugs. As far back as 1981 uh, in State versus Rifkin, the, the court said, you know, because of the constellation of, of, of or array of symptoms that a person who is suspected of driving under the influence of marijuana or a controlled substance might show, officers have to have particular expertise in determining whether someone's under the, under the influence of that drug, and therefore expert testimony is required. Now, I'm not saying that an officer has to be an expert to, to at least determine preliminarily on the side of the road whether a person is under the influence of marijuana or ambient or something else. The point is that uh, a, a road officer will invariably, in my experience, jump to the conclusion that the person is under the influence of the substance. Particularly marijuana, if, well, if they just smell marijuana, the person may have, uh, may have dry mouth. There is a world of difference between ingestion and consumption. And I, I'm assuming that you have heard from other, uh, other witnesses who talk about that, about how marijuana can remain in the body for 30 days or longer. Not yet, but Senator um, White has uh, brought that up. Okay. And in, in, in the context of the saliva testing bill, that's extremely important. And let, let me... Uh, let me just sidestep a little bit. Uh, when we're testing for saliva, uh, we don't know, because the effects of marijuana are fairly close in time to when it's first ingested, it can also remain in the body for an extended period of time. So a person, for example, who ingests medical marijuana uh, or who may have smoked a couple of days ago, uh, they're stopped, and maybe the officer smells marijuana in the car or something, it's all over. That's, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, I've seen that, and my colleagues know of it. That paves the way for a, uh, an arrest for probable cause of driving under the influence of marijuana. You get a, a blood sample if, if the person uh, consents to a search. And, I, and I've only in one case of mine have I seen Somebody actually, the officer actually got a warrant. Uh, but the person, we, we have a real danger here with people being prosecuted. If, if saliva testing is allowed in this state, people being prosecuted for driving under the influence of marijuana where they're being punished for ingestion and not necessarily impairment. Brad, can, can you go back to <laughs> one of your initial comments, and I'd like to understand it better. Um, regarding the automatic presumption that any sign of marijuana is under the, it, that the person's under the influence. And you, I think you were talking about somebody being driver who's caught with um, some marijuana in the vehicle. And have you had cases like that? Uh, well, what, what I think this, this falls under the heading of confirmation bias. I, my experience is that in marijuana cases, and uh, actually I've not yet defended a, uh, uh, an Indian case or, or some other substance. Uh, they, they've all been driving into the influence of marijuana cases. Uh, but my experience is that when an officer smells marijuana, and there is an admission mm -hmm. 
of consumption that everything that happens from that point forward is to support the the assumption that the person is under the influence versus simply having ingested marijuana at an earlier point in time. And unfortunately, in the DOA protocols that I've seen executed uh, by experienced officers, indicators of a lack of impairment, such as eyes, uh, pulse, things of that nature, are uh, they are excluded or minimized. I don't think that there is an even-handed administration of the DRA protocol in cases that I have seen, and that is because of the presumption of impairment. And that, that to me, is pure confirmation bias. If you're going to call yourself an expert, then you have to be impartial. And I'm sorry, but the DREs that I've seen uh, administrating, uh, administering the protocols. You can't call yourself an expert if you are arriving at an opinion based upon what, uh, you know, excluding, um, excluding facts that might not support your opinion or hypothesis. Brad, if somebody, um, there's no sign of marijuana, but they're, they do a breathalyzer and they come out at 0.04, um, do any of those get charged in your experience? Uh, I was trying to the influence of uh, yeah. Yeah. marijuana cases. No, no alcohol. alcohol. No sign of marijuana. Especially when it comes A minimum amount of uh, mar of alcohol? Yes. Below 0.08? Oh, yeah, yes. Yes. I think I have one now. Um, Senator White may know this from discussing with folks in the Brattleboro Criminal Defense Fund, but it's commonly known that Wyndham County uh, will prosecute to trial cases where people are uh, below 0 0.08, as low as 0 0.04, 0 0.06. Yeah. We're, we're hard on crime down there. You know? I'm sorry? <laughs> Senator White was commenting that they're hard on crime or that it's a uh, full employment yeah. employment full employment effort for defense <laughs> yes. Well, if this bill passes, and I hope it doesn't, but if it passes, it's going to be full employment for people like myself. Yeah. Because we're going to be, you know, uh, we're going to be litigating uh, yeah. these cases quite aggressively. And, and I think, you know, looking at the law of unintended consequences, um, you know, whenever the legislature passes a criminal justice bill, um, I, I hope that there's been a full understanding, and I mean no slight to members of the committee and, and uh, Senator Sears, for whom I have the greatest respect, but, you know, you pass a lot of testing, you're going to have an explosion of litigation, mm -hmm. and uh, we better have more judges prepared to handle these types of cases. Uh, Brad, one point that the Commissioner of Public Safety made, and Senator White and I have heard it from House members, that the reason that they voted for this was to get the tax and regulate of marijuana. And Commissioner of Public Safety basically said, without, without a saliva testing, the governor wouldn't support a tax and regulate system. And you and I have talked enough about marijuana, and I know your views in terms of tax and regulate, and you know that we support that as well. Um, how do you feel about that? I, I, to be honest with you, even though I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we finally have legalization in the state, I, I would not sacrifice, uh, I, I don't think that anything is worth the sacrifice for saliva testing. I really don't. And I'm, I'm going against my own self-interest in saying that, no. but it's just, it's not worth it. I, I, the thought of driving into Vermont from Massachusetts and seeing people standing by the side of the road in front of a police car spitting into a dish, that horrifies me. And that's a scene that's going to be repeated over and over again if we pass saliva testing. I, you know, we don't need saliva testing, period. There's not a compelling need, and certainly it should not be a quid pro quo 
for a tax uh, tax and regulating system. But you. So you may hear that from some other members. Okay, well, I just uh, <sighs> on why they voted for the bill. Right. Well, that's that's the wrong reason. That's the wrong reason. Um, I on that particular. Are there other questions that I can address? I, 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 I want to emphasize. Senator Benning has one question. And then. Yes, sir. Fred, the uh, implied consent form that gives the officer something to read from and advise mm -hmm. the potential offender that they are about to be asked to take a breath test and if they refuse, what the consequences are. Have you ever seen that actually done at roadside? No, never. Because it's not, um, no. So in your experience, have you ever seen a situation where an individual at roadside was actually given advice by the officer that the person had the right to refuse? Sometimes. Okay. Well, uh, less frequently than not. Uh, some officers will tell the person, you don't have to do this. But more often than not, um, the officer will just stick at the person's face and say, well, or use language such as, what I'd like you to do next is to provide a sample of your breath, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from here. Uh, person's <laughs> on the side of the road very rarely have the wherewithal to say, you know, well, do I have to do this or to do anything other than to go along with what the officer wants? Because that is that is the nature of the situation. They've done the roadside exercises and, and uh, they're, they're scared and they will go along with anything that the officer wants them to do. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thanks. Yep. But, um, let me uh, let me conclude if there are no other questions. Yep. With the uh, uh, the problem of driving under the influence of marijuana or drug driving uh, in Vermont generally has not risen, fortunately, to the level that would justify a special needs exception under Chapter 1, Article 11 of the Vermont Constitution, which would justify saliva testing. And I talk about this, uh, this would be pages uh, uh, 16 through 19 of my, of my uh, written remarks. In other words, in weighing the privacy interests inherent in bodily fluids, such as saliva, versus the social need, and that is to combat drug driving. The problem of drug driving in Vermont simply has not risen to the point where the, there would be a special needs exception under Article 11, as discussed in the Medina case, that would justify the uh, use of saliva testing in prosecution of driving under the influence of drug cases. I hope that the committee will take uh, the protection, uh, the concerns of Article 11 as I've raised, and as I know others have raised, very, very seriously, because once we go down that road, uh, we're not going to be able to come back. And I, I fear for, uh, I fear for us, I fear for visitors, if saliva testing were to become law in the state. And I ask that you, the, the, the fact that the House passed this bill by such a large margin, should in no way, I believe, influence your decision on what to, whether this bill should be committed and it should. Appreciate that uh, and your thorough analysis on, um, that on the DUI drug defense enforcement challenge report. Can I make a comment? Yeah. So just so that you know, whatever the House does very rarely influences us. We try to look at the issue um, anew. And, and make our own decisions. I, I appreciate that. And um, I, uh, there are other things that I want to say about that, but um, I want to be judicious, and so I won't. <laughs> but I have, I have great faith uh, in this committee, several uh, members I, I know. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to give them cliche. I hope you do the right thing. But I think this is a terrible, terrible bill 
that should not go any further than this. Appreciate that. Thank you. Brad, thanks for Thank taking you, time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. My pleasure. Thank you. See you folks. back home. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now. Um, next Where is he from? Manchester? Manchester. But he represents mainly in southern Vermont, probably back to Wyndham, yeah. 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 Um, the next witness um, I have on the list, and I'm going to uh, skip mm -hmm. to the Newport Police Chief and then have Fred last. So then he can go home. Mm -hmm. I realize that Newport's not as far as Bennington, but it is a way to come <laughs> So we did, just before the Chief starts, uh, yeah. we had our tour up you know, on our law enforcement yeah. tour, and the chief joined us at our hearing in Newport. He did indeed. So he did indeed. And I've just had a very enlightening conversation about the um, licensing, and I'll share it oh, with did, you okay, when great. we're done. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Chief. Morning, sir. My name is Seth DeSano. I'm the chief of the Newport Police Department, representing the Vermont Associations of Chiefs of Police. Um, Next year, Bennington County. Jeanette White from Wyndham. Allison at Windsor County. Joe Benning from Caledonia County. Benning. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the Vermont Associations of Chiefs of Police, I, I don't want to take a lot of your time to uh, reiterate a lot of what the commissioner said. The, the association, the 55 chiefs in the state of Vermont, the Department of Public Safety are in lockstep on this bill. Um, for all of the reasons that that um, Commissioner Anderson's already testified to, so I don't I, I don't see the need to, to repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, a couple of things that I did want to clarify um, in reference to some of the testimony that we've heard between the commissioner and now. Um, the, in terms of the collection of evidentiary saliva tests or oral fluid testing and blood testing is no different than what we're already doing. It's just that we're not going to be sticking a needle in someone's arm to get the evidentiary portion of it, which is much less in intrusive, um, as the commissioner said. So uh, I just I wanted to clarify the, the conception that um, this is going to change the process instrumentally. It's not. We already have the process, it's just a way of doing it less intrusively. Um, in terms of the, the, uh, the roadside testing, that is non-evidentiary testing, just as the PBT would be. So whether or not it comes back on roadside as positive or negative, you have to have those pre-cues to even get you to that point. So for example, in my career, not once have I ever pulled someone over and jumped right to, hey, blow into this to see if you're intoxicated. I would have to have multiple factors leading up to that point before I would even consider the idea or option of that tool. Um, in my toolbox for investigating. Um, and then lastly, you know, um, I, I heard what um, the gentleman on the phone stated, and I just, I want to put you in the shoes of a law enforcement officer for just a few minutes and, and imagine what it's like to go to someone's house and tell them that a loved one has passed away as a result of a DUI or vehicular crash. I mean, that's really the essence of what law enforcement's trying to do here. We want to make our highways safer. That's the idea. The idea is not to be able to have more statistics or to make more arrests or, or do anything like that. We've gone down the road of legalization. Okay, we're there. We now need to put processes in place that are gonna allow us to protect your constituents and the public that we're charged in protecting. Um, that's really what this bill is about it, from the Bay Cops perspective, is, is trying to keep people on the roadways safer. Um, I don't know if you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask me. Yes, Senator Yes, sir. Um, Chief, I don't, I don't think we've ever met before. No, sir. Practiced often up in Rollins County. And uh, first question that I have, and I do have a couple. You go to the Vermont Police Academy? Yes, sir. Implied consent form, would you agree with me? That's the document that you read to tell somebody that you're processing that they have a right to refuse to take the next test. Yes, sir. Have you ever administered that test, that implied consent form? Yes, sir. How many times would you say you've done that? Over 100. 
In any of those times, have you ever done that at roadside? No, sir. So every time that you've ever asked somebody to take a breath test and read the implied consent form, it had to do with the evidentiary test, not the roadside test. Yes, sir. Um, so how would somebody at roadside know that they have a right to refuse to take that test? In 100% of the DUI cases, I have always told the person the next step is optional. Is that the way you are trained at the academy? I believe so. I, I don't know why I would offer up that information if, if I hadn't been instructed to do so, but I feel it's my duty to explain to someone that I'm not twisting your arm to do anything. You're not, there's, there'll be no penalty if you don't. Do you give that instruction to the officers under your watch? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. In your experience, what's more effective, the roadside test or the video from either your body camera or from the cruiser, if you have that newport, um, of the person trying to go through the sobriety check? Yeah, so in Newport, we have both the dash cam and the body cam for all officers. Um, the, the preliminary roadside breath test to me means nothing when I'm processing a DUI unless I have, I have to have built something to get to that point. And so I just, I want the committee to understand that law enforcement officers do not go out and make a, a roadside traffic stop and say, well, this car was coming from the area where a bar was, so I'll give him a PBT. You've got to have something to get you there. My question is that the, the, you know, the videos that I've seen of a former state elected official going through the roadside test, the video I saw at Tiger Woods going through the roadside test, mm -hmm. those things are conclusive to me that the person was impaired. And see, I would disagree with that completely. And you would disagree with that? Yes, sir, because there are plenty of times where I've stopped a motor vehicle and said, this guy's hammered. And come to find out, he's had absolutely nothing to drink, and in my estimation and in their estimation, no, no illegal illicit drugs to consume, but they're having a diabetic emergency. That happens routinely, and I don't know why it happens routinely in Orleans County, but it seems to happen <laughs> routinely. Um, you know, that, that's a perfect example of someone that I would not allow to continue to drive. It's about safety. It's not about an arrest. It's not about a stat. It's about making sure that everybody else that's on the road, including that one driver, is safe to drive. And that's why I feel like this, that's why the Vermont Associations of Chiefs of Police feel like this, um, this is just one more tool to put in the toolbox. It's not the end all be all. Not necessarily gonna get us to where we need to go. Other questions for the Chief? Chief, thanks so much for making the trip. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Thank it. Very thanks. Uh, Fred, Delfana uh, from North American Products. Are you meeting? No, ma'am. I'll stay. Oh, okay. 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 North American Products. Yeah. Hopefully. It's I'm going to show you. Uh oh. He's got a machine. <laughs> Fred Delfano from North American Products Manager with Abbott. Abbott? Uh, yes, I am with Abbott. My name is Fred Delfino. I am the North American Product Manager for the Allier DBS2, which is one of several products that are used around the country in roadside testing with oral fluid. You call it oral fluid? Yes. I met Fred about two weeks ago, so we went through the oral fluid discussion. Oh. <laughs> and uh, Fred would probably dispel the idea of spitting into a can. Or a dish. Or a dish. <laughs> <laughs> so, much like the chief had said, devices that test for oral fluid by the roadside are designed to save lives. I mean, that's really what you're here to talk about. It's not about who's doing drugs and who's not doing drugs. It's about saving lives and making the roadways safer. Oral fluid in general um, has been accepted and validated throughout the scientific community for several years. It's most of your ma major laboratories are um, doing oral fluid testing, whether it be on hospital patients, clinical patients, corrections. Uh, even in workplace testing, it's taken a very predominant step forward. 
Um, and we spoke earlier, uh, Senator, you spoke about uh, truck drivers. So it's moving into that arena too. And there's several reasons for it because the value that oral fluids brings into this set setting is the ability to identify the drug use or recent drug use with the findings of the DRE or the officer, okay? So you're getting that information closest to the traffic stop. So there's a lot of talk about how long it'll stay in the system. One of the most valuable parts of oral fluid testing is getting it immediately. The drop-off rate, and we always talk about marijuana, drops off within two hours, those levels start just plummeting down. So when we're collecting blood, in a lot of cases, we're not doing ourselves justice because those samples may be collected two hours or so after we have the traffic stop. So looking for parent drug, Delta-9, is what we're looking for in oral fluid. We're not looking for the metabolites of marijuana. We are looking for the parent drug. And that's what we're identifying. We're not identifying a CBD. We're not going to be testing positive for CDB, CDBs as well. Okay, so the true value is, is the timely collection, getting that information of the recent drug use most immediate to the traffic stop. I think we've seen and heard about invasiveness. Um, it's minimally invasive. And when you compare it to blood, you compare it to a hair test, or you compare it to a urine screen, um, it's the least of the, out of the four matrices, it's the least invasive um, sample that you could collect. Recently, we've seen uh, the state of Oklahoma their board of testing, which handles all of their alcohol testing, has recently uh, approved oral fluid testing for roadside. They've approved several devices uh, that they've listed in the state uh, through the Attorney General's office to, uh, to be used uh, for roadside screening. We're seeing the same thing being uh, conducted at this point in Alabama. They've recently, uh, they've conducted several studies in Alabama with several devices with oral fluid compared to blood and they've seen greater than 95% accuracy as well compared to blood. So there's no drop off. If anything, you're gaining the ability to detect the drug before it's moved out of the system a lot sooner than you would with blood. So instruments like the DDS-2, like the Draeger, who was a competitor product, some of the value in running tests this way is they're providing you with an objective result. Okay. It's not subjective to an officer to make an interpretation on the test result. The instrument is actually performing the test under the correct conditions and then interpreting the test results, printing them out, and saving, archiving them in the system as well. So there is no Officer Jones said he was positive. It's the instrument that's putting that test result out. There's no interpretation whatsoever. And I feel that that's a very valuable part when you're looking at um, the rights of individuals and making interpretations. Again, this is your screening tool. This is what they spoke to about earlier about confirmation testing um, at the laboratory, okay? So this is the evidential collection system is all it is. In systems like the roadside DDS-2 and the Draeger products, you're going to find we're testing for six drugs. We don't see the issue being strictly marijuana. In fact, I think in some of the pilots you've seen around the country, you might see it in some of your data from your laboratory here um, with some of the roadside cases. We're finding fairly equal distribution of positivity rates among opiates, methamphetamines, cocaine, and other drugs. So it's not. It's not just focused on marijuana, that's what brings us to the table today, but you'll see in other studies, for instance, Senator White, you asked a question earlier about what determines uh, the drugs we test for. Well, NITS has done roadside surveys every four or five years, and based on that data, 90% of the positive they've, they've seen have been the drugs that are on this type of menu. So that's kind of what drives us when we're making a product to fit into a marketplace, we're looking at the data that's been established on the roadside. And those surveys were done in California and all throughout the country. I just want to be clear, this that I'm holding is the actual device that would be sent to the laboratory. It's a collection system. This would be collected at the barracks as opposed to that machine being administered on the roadside. Correct? I don't make the policies, but correct. Let's assume we're going to mirror our alcohol situation. 
this would not be taken until the individual was brought back to the barracks. They would have been gone through all the implied consent forms and potentially speaking with an attorney, if we're going to mirror what we do for alcohol, mm -hmm. before this sample could be taken. So would it be fair to say that the drop-off would be a problem? We prefer to see collection scientifically done simultaneously, so we're getting two pieces of evidence at the same amount of time. Right. And again, it's going to, th this is the case where blood may take two hours, getting them to the station and getting that second collection may not take that long. And confirmation testing is going to be done at a much lower level, more specific to the drugs. We're testing drug classes here. I don't want to get too deep into that, but for instance, marijuana is at a 25 nanogram level. So we're not looking for bottom of the barrel, so to speak, numbers. We're looking for recent use marijuana at 25 nanograms. Your laboratory will probably test that at like five or two, somewhere down there. Just walk through this because I want to make sure I'm clear in the sequence of events. By the time that this is taken, a period of time will have transpired between this and that mm -hmm. particular machine. Your machine only tells us whether there is something present. Am I correct? Or is that telling me something more than that? It's telling you it's positive for that specific okay. drug. That result is not admissible in court. And it has no use whatsoever in the court system if people are actually following the procedure of the statute. This ends up being taken after all the processing is accomplished and the individuals had an opportunity to speak with their attorney. This is then sent to the laboratory and that's where the evidentiary test surfaces. Correct. Okay, thank you. So, maybe you're getting to this, but so do you have the saliva, the sample that the person uses when they're first checked at the roadside? for a saliva sample, or, or how's that? Because you said this is the one for evidentiary. Is so that that's evidentiary, so that one? Oh, yeah, okay. collecting a sample and running the test um, a roadside. Would, again, the value is yeah. giving you the immediacy of the result. We're not saying, yeah. oral fluid, whether it's tested here or at the laboratory, and blood, whether tested at the laboratory, neither one of those are gonna tell you someone's impaired. And there's never gonna be a test that's gonna determine that. It's a tandem. Right. It sets an inference, though, that currently in the alcohol situation, we are presuming someone under the influence if they're over a point of weight. Mm -hmm. That's something that can be argued in court. We don't have that same mechanism yet set up for drug analysis. I guess I'm just pointing that out. Okay. Senator White, I So, why, what are the six drugs that you're testing for? We're, yeah. Yes, so we're testing for amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, opiates, which is morphine and heroin, yeah. marijuana, and benzodiazepines. Would, it, would, it, would, the, uh, would it show up uh, methadone or suboxone? No. We don't have that on our test, this particular so that, test panel. That was using that would show up as just heroin. Not on this panel, correct. So what, are these the only um, impairment drugs? I, I mean, it, I, I, I'm just trying to figure out why. Um, Maybe the, 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 the tell us what he just did. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I, I tried, because I didn't want to do this for a minute. I did I, okay. honestly. I pre-soaked a little bit just for the sake of time. I swab my mouth. The swabbing process, on average, will take 60 seconds or okay. less. And when we asked a question earlier, how do you know how much if you got enough oral fluid? There's a blue indicator that shows up on the wand that it basically turns blue. The indicator and says you've got enough oral fluid, and then you insert it into the instrument. And then it shows if there if one of these six things Correct. shows up. This one has the blue on it. Can you show us? So the swab has. Um, I, mean, I know the other one does. This is an old. I did this this morning just to be prepared. But you see down here, there's no. a blue indicator. So it just turns blue. And where's the swab on that? One? That's the swab at the end there. Oh. And I. And you stuck it in there. Correct. Go ahead. 
you were asking the question about well, just wanting to make people aware that he mm -hmm. swapped his, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> not a chance, not a chance. So, I, I just, um, so, amphetamines are illegal, right? Mm -hmm. Methamphetamine is illegal. And there's cocaine. a lot of positive methamphetamines cocaine. out there, correct. Cocaine is, uh, marijuana is in most places still. Opiates, some are and some are. Well, no, it's heroin and what? It's morphine and heroin. Morphine and heroin. So, and benzo is that? Those are your Valium class. Those are the, okay. So that's a. These are drug those classes. Are classes. So we test the drug class. We screen the so class. The opiate would include the oxycodone. Yeah. Ours will cross react at a very high level of oxy. So it's not designed to detect oxy by itself. If they're abusing it at extremely high levels, we will pick it up on our morphine test. On an average use, someone who's prescribed using it under the right parameters by their doctor, they're not going to test positive with oxy. It's not. I'm still asking. No, I'm just on each of these. Then, so I it shows that I have. Uh, it says a ding. If I test positive for opiate, I mean it's each category. It says a ding if you if it shows up in your system. So I am taking a, a I think benzodiazepines, um, Wellbutrin, and those are under there, right? So I'm taking that for depression, and it shows up there. So now, what does that say? What does it say to anybody that I, it shows up on the ding there that I'm, I have Wellbutrin in my system as opposed to um, a horrible lack of sleep, which I had Tuesday and drove up here and I probably shouldn't have been driving because I only got three hours of sleep. But that isn't going to show up anywhere. Mm -hmm. that, and so why, why do we even care what th this says if there's something in my system? If it has, I guess it, it, it I, I'm trying to wrap my head around why we care if somebody has a ding in their system, unless we're trying to do this, whatever he called the confirmation bias, that we're now going to show that they had it in there. And so we're going to confirm our suspicion, our assumption that they were impaired, as opposed to me having a lack of sleep. They're not going to do a test on that to show that I was impaired. That, that's my question. Okay. And you're not probably the person to answer it because you're, you're, you have the product. You don't make the policy. Well, the policy is a big part of it. But what I, what I can say is these systems are designed to test at a certain level where it shows they're above as positive. Well, if you're taking a daily antidepressant, under prescription the way you're supposed to take it, okay, you're probably going to be okay. It's abusive levels. People abuse those pills. See, not everybody yeah, yeah, just I takes know. that one a day. And so yeah. that tied with, once again, we go back to the officer has reasons to pull someone over, the officer goes through a process, and eventually when it comes down to the test, he's going to run the test and he's going to determine whether it's the DRE and the tox test together. They'll determine if it's a benzodiazepine, if it's an opiate, if it's THC or cocaine. Because that's what the DRE process does, is it narrows this down just like this instrument does through their observations to exactly what drug class that individual is taking. So... Okay. Yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. So... Are the roads... You can pass this around as the results. Safer than the roads in Vermont? So, tough question to answer in terms of data. Are they safer? But the st <laughs> so the so states that use this, you have a tool to take me off the road if that's me. Maybe not arrest me, but you're alerted that I've recently used drugs. Maybe I failed the field sobriety test on along the roadside, and you're taking me off the road and taking it to the next step. 
that potentially, every single person you do that with, you're, you potentially are saving lives on the other side. We have a state like Michigan, who has recently uh, implemented a, a program, a pilot project amongst five counties with their DREs, where they're doing this statewide right now. And their legislation has law in there that says you have to give a sample. So it's treated like the breath testing is being treated in Michigan. In Canada right now, north of your border, they're about to deploy a system like this throughout the country for their legalization process. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts has done pilot projects. So there is a lot going. California yesterday passed their legislation allowing this type of testing to occur. But there's no evidence that this would make our highways safer. Thank you. The only evidence you would have is basically um, the data through the testing, like NHTSA has shown over the years. So take a step back. Where were we? Where are we going with this whole process? Okay. You go backwards in time with DUI, okay, and you go back to Matt and Candace Leitner and folks like that who, who lost people and started this whole process of, you know, don't drink and drive. Well, I think it was two years ago, NHTSA put out data showing the positive effect of not just the testing or the arrests, but also the public awareness and what it's done. We've seen, so the proof there is we've seen the data show the DUIs have come down. Those same effects have not been put in place with drug testing, roadside, with drivers, whether it be with this or even the blood in the laboratory. A lot of states stop at an alcohol screen and they don't bother checking for the drugs. And we have found that together you know, the, the effects are multiplied on the roadways. But what NHTSA found in that study was, because they do these roadside surveys, the alcohol went down, but the drugs are on the uprise. So there is some evidence there to speak of that. One other key point, because I want to go back to Senator White's comments this morning about the Colorado data, and I, I agree with her, we're not sure how that data was put together, because Colorado chose not to participate. Well, they came legal faster than they had policies in place. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't, they played, they're still playing catch up, right, to what they did. They turned down an opportunity, once it, it became legal, you have a window of time. They didn't want to do any pre, any, any roadside surveys prior to actual retail sales. Washington State did that. So NHTSA funded through PIRE, which is a, a research group, a study in Washington State Prior to implementation of retail sales, they did roadside testing, and then they did another one six months, a year, and then a year and a half later. And in those studies, they found prior to legalization, they had a certain rate, but it increased over the next 18 months after legalization. And what they really found was most of us would think, we're going to see this at nighttime drivers. The biggest increase was daytime drivers, which is scary, because that's where our school buses, our kids are, people, more people are on the roads during the day. So that's what they, they did it the right way because they they participated in that process. Did their tests show that more people tested positive or more people were impaired? They had more positive screens, more if positive I recall. More positive screens, if I, but I, not necessarily more I, impairment. Honestly, I, I yeah. don't know the exact okay. details to that. And certainly, they Washington State has published a lot of information relating to their their drug driving mm -hmm. program they they i have to commend they've got one of the best data collection processes in place so far and they're they're kind of being looked at as a model of what they're doing at this point and they're doing the testing yes um with your machines right now i think they're still doing a laboratory base but they're piling the, some some oral fluid instruments um We've had a lot of arguments pro and con this morning, um, but isn't a DRE as well as an A ride program just as effective as any of this? First, you have to observe somebody driving in Perry, and fortunately or unfortunately, you know, on my rides to Montpelier and to Bennington and back from Montpelier, I tell you, I'd see maybe one or two police officers the entire 123 miles. So if there's no police officer out there, and I drive in back roads, interstate highway, most of us do get here. It's curious, just curious to that, um, that we have 
you know, so few people who actually are out there on the highways. All this assumes that you're going to have a number of law enforcement, you're going to have the proper number of those deaths and proper number of DREs. I'm sure if I'm driving through Newport, I'm probably more likely, if I'm driving through Bennington, I'm more likely to see a piece of police officer than I am anywhere else on my trip to Bennington, Montpelier. Yet I'm sure there's impaired drivers. Mm -hmm. I live in the country in Connecticut. And we have a very small police force, and it's the same thing. People can drive around farmland all day long and never see a police officer. So, I mean, that's unfortunate. We don't have the coverage that we need. Um, the testing, again, is one step in the toolbox for them to use. The DRE's examination or the A-Ride officer's findings leads to the screening test. Again, it's just a screening. It's, it's to send up the flag that says, we've got to be careful here. There's, there's something in the system. So you're not arresting roadside based on this. And it's, and it's always been a tandem process. Yeah, no, go first. Um, this probably will come up in appropriation should we get that far, but can I ask what the going rate is for one of these? So the test on average for the test itself, the cartridge and the swab, mm -hmm. are $20 okay. on average. The units themselves? The instrument itself, List price is forty-five hundred dollars if you buy one. Life expectancy about five years before, and life expectancy is only based on new technology coming along as we redevelop. I mean, we're doing things right now for the, for Canada that are going to bring this another step higher. It's not going to change the instrument; it's a software upgrade. So, is there a maintenance schedule of any kind? So great question. Um, unlike a breathalyzer, so here's where they differ a little bit. We're not analyzing. The instrument is, is performing the right environment, temperature controlled, to run the test. The test is being run inside of these cartridges. Okay, there's a buffer on the back side of this. So it comes pre-calibrated. So unlike a breath test where they have to be regularly calibrated, we have an annual maintenance. Send it in once a year. The instrument's going to let you know when it's, when it's maintenance is coming, and then it's going to tell you when it's due. And you send it back to our facility, we maintenance it, and we send it back out. Is that part of the initial expense, or is that an additional expense? Under the first year, it's part of the cost of the instrument, and there's options to buy additional service from there. Okay. Can I ask Dr. Conte a question, because I have to be out here shortly? Um, we have a relation back formula for breath tests. Is there any such formula in existence right now for the uh, for cannabis, for instance? No, and not for any other drug other than alcohol. Thank you. Can you explain what you just asked? Much? Yeah, when you are um, the preliminary breath test at the roadside for alcohol, right. you go from there assuming there's a positive result and you've flunked whatever other tests are observable, you end up going to the station and you have a data master test taken. The data master test is taken at a given point in time. You were last driving at a given point right. in time. The question of whether you were impaired at that point in time means there has to be a relation back from your test result oh, back to the point where you were driving. You. Sometimes you're going up, sometimes you're going down, depending on the circumstances. So we have a formula in place for determining what so, you were at the time you were driving. If you were to blow point one, point zero, you know, 0.10, whatever, 0.08. Yep. When you got back to the office, to the barracks, you would to the barracks. You would probably have been a point one zero at the time. I, I will let the experts say that <laughs> answer the question. But you could, as I understand it, be going up or down depending on several different factors. Right. So we look at the amount of time that's lapsed between operation when the test was taken, and then part of the interview question that the officer has with the operator. Um, are you know when was your last drink and so questions to that so. when when that when, and back to Fred when that item your that little cartridge that you showed us mm -hmm. does that go to the lab and then they check that or is there any other thing that happens with your test? so when the cartridge is removed 
from the instrument, the swab is still in the cartridge. Okay. And at that point, they can put it in the bag like I just did. And you have a choice of throwing it away. And this is policy, so I can't really dictate. But the option does exist to say, here you go, sir. Here's your, your sample. So when you're concerned about DNA on here, I'll give it back to you. It's, they can't do anything with this. They can't test themselves. You know, the instrument's pretty sophisticated. I can't take this and stick it in there and try to run a test and say, you know, oh, his was positive, so I'm gonna put his positive screen in and test you, and you, it won't. It's reading barcodes, it knows if it's expired, it knows if it's been run before, it logs them all in as you need. It's a very, it, there's more than meets the eye with the instrument, it's very, very sophisticated, um, you know, in terms so of, of that. If Newport had one of those machines, they can only afford one, $4,500 plus all the We'd other. give them a deal. <laughs> okay. Let's assume that Newport had one of those machines. And I don't know how many officers Newport has. I would have been better off saying Bennington with like 23 officers. And I don't know how many cars, but you've only got one of those machines. It's kind of a spotty thing whether or not person A gets stopped by the officer with that machine and person B gets stopped by an officer without the machine. Mm -hmm. that, is that what's going on okay, around I'll be the back. So they're used yeah, different. I mean, everybody, you know, I would assume everybody in the Newport Police Department has a body camera. Everybody has, all the vehicles have a uh, camera on the vehicles. So your odds are you're going to get stopped by a, you know, you know that everybody is. But with those, you're not having, everybody doesn't have them. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming Canada's buying, what, 500? Thousands. 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 5,000. Spain just bought five. Their first order was for five well, to seven hundred. Well, big country. Yes. So, I mean, well, they have a similar problem because I'm, I'm sure out if I get if I was out in the Yukon where Senator Benning was just to have last winter last summer, his chances of getting caught by some police officer with one of those machines is minuscule versus if he's driving in downtown Montreal. I, how is that? I mean, that sound of I assume that everybody has a, has a breathalyzer, right? But not everybody will have one of those. And so we're going to allow saliva, but it's going to be very selective as to which officer had it, which officer did it. So the single investment in the point is that you know, the machine goes with the vehicle, right? Sure. And that one officer. Or it can be moved around to other officers. Massachusetts did a sobriety checkpoint in their pilot evaluation where they had these set up at sobriety checkpoints, um, and they did it that way. So, you know, it, it really comes down to budget and ability to deploy different technology where you need it deployed. Um, Price-wise, they do come down, but as, as you heard uh, in previous testimony, um, just a collection rate alone for blood is anywhere from 50 to $200. So we're looking at a $20 test. And I, I'm, I'm just I'm not arguing your, your machine. And I'm not arguing whether it's a good investment or bad investment. I'm arguing from the perspective of the, the chances of me driving from Bennington to um, Montpelier and back 256 miles every week. What are my chances of you know, if we're going to keep our highways safer and this machine is going to be an investment in that and we um, provide the, the bill to allow this, what are my chances of the officer having one of those machines versus not having one? If it's the constable that likes to yeah. stop you all the time, he'll probably get it because he might I don't get think a the kickback on the... I don't think he'll get it unless he stops so? enough people to be able well, to... Well, I was going to say... Buy it We're finding so, a lot of the, uh, chief. If you wanted to answer that, yeah, question. I would just say so. This portable radio is fifty-four hundred dollars mm -hmm. per. I can't afford twenty of these, and I have twenty officers. So at the beginning of the shift, here are the keys to the car. Here's your radio. Here's your device. This is yours for the shift. At the end of the shift, give me the device, give me the keys to the car, and give me the radio. That, that's how Newport PD would afford a program to implement like that, and then eventually, hopefully, through grant funds and what have you, we purchase more. Right. Yeah, more. And a lot, a lot has been happening with grant funding with with instruments. So one one of the I, I realize that this is, uh, but everybody says it's one more tool in the tool chest, or however we want to use that term. And that first, you have to have the um, 
the driving, the impaired driving, stop before you use this. But I don't think that that's always true, and I don't think that the chief would ever do this, but there are um, a lot of stops that are stops for defective equipment, speeding, speeding is probably impaired driving, but it, not necessarily. Defective equipment, you open the window and smell marijuana and boom, you're gonna assume that the person is impaired. So I, I think that that's, that you don't even have to have the impaired driving in order to do something like this because we see a lot of drug stops result from uh, stupidity. <coughs> so stupidity. Not, stupidity, stupidity on the part of the driver because oh, they're going 100 miles an oh, hour or, or and I don't mean stupidity on the terms of the officer I mean stupidity on the part of the well, person who's driving or that they didn't register case. their car or in that's the parking lot at the Bodmont Factory's home on Sunday or Monday where a person who's a resident we don't, who went out to have a cigarette and is in a car lit the cigarette and then dropped the match on the floor where a bunch of papers were and the car went on fire and oh God, next God. to the car was parked a brand new Chevy Tahoe by been owned by one of the staff members at the veterans home and both were burned up in the in the fire. So I suppose he was not impaired rampant. but he, he was he was he stupid. did have his cigarette. Oh my God. So, can I ask a question? Sorry. Go ahead. Can I just ask a question with regard? I had probably nothing to do with the trip, but it's interesting. With regard to the things the evidentiary sample, the, the second one. Mm -hmm. Where? How? What's the? Uh, when does that lose its vitality or whatever? It's a short-term life. So it comes. There's a buffer in there, it's and in the, and the buffer helps retain the drug concentration right, and also the extraction it, how long process. Is it good for? Um, I'm not sure exactly because this isn't my laboratory no, no, side of the maybe. work. Do you, do you have a I know there's definitely a shelf life on them. Um, it's not as stable as blood samples would be, uh, but I can't tell you for certain because we've not done a study ourselves on it and I haven't looked into that. But You had the voluntary program, right? A while back. The pod study, yes. So there's nothing to mm -hmm. prevent you from doing that at a sobriety checkpoint under current law commission, uh, not commissioner. Doing a pilot study at a checkpoint? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely not. That Because it would be all voluntary. Right. Yes. It can't be used in and that, that's what NHTSA did with the roadside surveys around the country is it was volunt and they, they actually paid people for blood um, and oral fluid so they could collect the data. So quick question, yep. um, Senator White spoke about the speeding thing. Mm -hmm. So one thing Colorado has done since legalization and, and enforcing roadside testing is they've collected data for the reason for the stop for people who've tested positive. And most of us think that I drive better when I'm stoned. I go slow, et cetera. The number one reason for a traffic stop for that in, under, based on the individuals testing positive was speeding because they're overcompensating for what their brain has slowed down and they're overcompensating in their driving. And I've, I've seen them present this data at highway safety conferences. Nobody in the room, hundreds of people ever, ever comes up and says speeding. And he puts the data up and he's got all the, yeah. they've got a lot of good metrics they've collected over the years to, to demonstrate that. So it kind of refutes the fact that I drive better when I'm stoned. No, but uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of uh, leeway between being stoned and testing positive though. Oh, sure. Yeah. But we're looking at yeah, I, marijuana, I we're looking at eight to nine hours in oral fluid after recent use. Passive inhaling is virtually non existent It is non-existent at, cer at these levels that uh -huh. we're testing at. So the whole theory of someone else was smoking, yeah. I was at a, that doesn't exist. Yeah. And we do have white right. papers peer reviewed. Yeah. We have three peer reviewed white papers right. that were done. Sure. Uh, so we'll hear from Marshall, Chloe, and Graham. Is there anybody else that we didn't hear from? 
now we're going to hear from them? No. Oh. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. Marshall and Chloe? Yeah. And Brian. Is there anybody else that would like to speak next week? Okay. Good.